Uh, hi, Karina. Hi, Harriet. I think I've got 15 members and some other channels might, might laugh at that, but I'm actually very grateful. Uh, I know that this is really a tough subject to make very interesting, especially from my perspective as a sort of a true crime channel. It feels like a bit of a deviation. Uh, I'm actually really pleased with how things have gone so far. Um, my, the last live has been viewed 2,900 times or so. Um, you know, I've, I've had some videos in the Van Gogh playlist. If you're not aware of it, check it out. That have been viewed 900 times. Um, very, very little. Some, I think, 600. So I'm kind of used to um, not being particularly, people not being particularly interested in this topic in terms of this channel. And hopefully this series is actually going to change and I've put a lot of work into it. If you're not sure what this is about, we are looking at this book by art expert, art e expert uh, Martin Bailey. And in this episode, episode two in the series, we'll be dealing with chapter two, which is dealing with the eclectic doctor. And just a couple of pages uh, that we, we're dealing with, just, um, you know, four or five, maybe six pages, and then on to the third chapter. This, I must say, is an interesting chapter, one that I've been looking forward to, and one that I think you guys are also going to find quite interesting. Um I'm going to do something similar to, to what I did in the last episode. I'm going to take you through just a couple of other magazine articles. These are these have already been sort of filed away. I've taken them out of my file. Um, when I was a magazine journalist, I wrote for lots of magazines, newspapers, and so on. And they, they sort of all those magazine clippings fill up four files. So this comes out of that. I'll take you guys to that in a moment. And the reason why I really want to show this to you is because of how it started. It started with an article I did on my great-grandfather. I put a little, short little collage of some of his work in the previous video on uh, art fraud, dealing with Alec Baldwin. You can see a couple of his paintings there. Um, but he was popular enough and his art expensive enough for his etchings, thousands of etchings, to be um, faked, you know. So, so you know, you know, you, you know you're pretty good when, when that's taking place. I've also got to say I've had some of my books, um, I've had people contact me to say that, people are plagiarizing my work, literally in other books. Um, so in a way, that's kind of a compliment, right? That you're doing something right, that someone feels that your worth is worth, worth stealing kind of thing. Um, I see Axis here, and Axis is a member. That's great to see you. Rudka, great to see you as well. PW, first time as a member, great to see you. Paddy. So... What I really like about this format is it's quite intimate. Um, there are fewer of you, and so you also want to be here, and so I can actually deal with the, the smallish sort of group. It's not sort of overwhelming. Uh, there's also a sense of continuity. Um, as I get to know you, I get to know where you're coming from, and uh, I can kind of address your um, how can I put it, your questions, your doubts, your interests, whatever, you know. So Karina says, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, for sure. So um, just before we get into this, two or three things I want to mention. One is this is quite a difficult episode to um, set up because... Um, and it's happened quite a few times now. I don't do lives for a long time. Then when I do do lives, just coincidentally, um, the power utilities here start to shudder. It's almost like, you know, if I do a live, it just overburdens the 
electric capacity of the country. But anyway, and so right now we're in um, stage two load shedding, which means that two two hour um, power failures per day. And in fact, one of them interrupted the scripting of this episode. Um, it wasn't serious. I, I, I kind of expected that it was coming, but I was still kind of caught up in what I was doing and I probably lost 15 to 20 minutes of writing and, you know, writing that I put down, which is quite a lot. Um, I did kind of want to kick myself after that happened. Um, so there was also another power failure a little while ago, but this uh, should go through without a hitch before the next one. So one's got to kind of dodge these power failures in order to do this sort of thing. So um, I don't think it's going to last for too long. It's stage two will probably be over by this weekend or so, uh, touch wood, whole terms. So that's the one thing. Um, I'm just trying to think what the other thing was. Um, oh, this picture behind me. So uh, I don't know if you guys saw the previous episode. We had um, a portrait of Vincent van Gogh, and it was kind of glassy. So this is a canvas print of a painting that he did in um, Orvez was And the story behind this picture is quite special to me. Um, I, as, as I've said to you guys, I've traveled to um, France, I traveled to all or where was, Paris, whatever, and I kind of retraced Vincent van Gogh's steps and <clears throat> I kind of had um, some um, bad things happen to me during the trip. So although I loved Orvez who was, there was some sort of not great incidents. Uh, one of them was I'd, I'd um, arranged to eat in the Ravu Inn, which is where Vincent van Gogh uh, slept and dined and possibly drank and whatever, also where he died. So I kind of made a booking to have lunch in that restaurant. And when I moved from the one Airbnb to the next, I cut it quite fine. And when I got to the other Airbnb, I kind of, when I turned around, the, the, the driver had gone. And I had like five or 10 minutes to make that uh, booking. And then what happened was, you know, the, uh, the driver was gone and then I, I appealed to the kind of the owner of the, the guest house who was like, no, nah, it's okay, you know, you'll, you can do it some other time. And I don't know, I was furious. I didn't shout at her and I wasn't like steam coming out of my ears, but um, I thought I'd kind of missed a chance of a life and that's kind of how much it meant to me. And... Um, Anyway, you know, it didn't really mean very much because I was able to make another booking. Uh, for some reason, I didn't think that was going to be easy because there were there were so many queues everywhere. Wherever there was a Van Gogh thing, there were like queues and whatever. Even in the south of France, you know, you'd um, I was I think on on a bicycle was walking down like a a pont, which is like a, the, the French word for canal. And there was like a, a um, painting, uh, how can I put it, a, um, a little platform and that on that platform is like a um, sample of Vincent van Gogh's painting kind of in front of, the, of, of, a, of a particular scene showing that, that, you know, he painted this artwork from this position, whatever. And, you know, next thing a bus stops there and 50 people get out. And in, uh, in that occasion, I think it was, um, you know, perhaps Japanese tourists or someone or something. And um, suddenly this quiet scene is just suddenly kind of overrun with, with tourists. Um, the Van Gogh Museum also queues to get in. And so I don't, know, I, I don't know why, but I thought, well, you know, getting another booking into this restaurant where Van Gogh um, lived and died and ate and slept and so on is going to be impossible. I've lost my chance and 
I was able to get one, another one kind of immediately. I don't know whether I lucked out, but you know, I was pretty upset, but um, that feeling then, you know, obviously gave way to, to joy and relief and all that kind of thing. But it was actually from that, that second Airbnb, which was, um, I've got some photos of it and photos from it. I've actually been putting some photos of my trip through France on Patreon. So those on Patreon get the benef that added benefit. But um, this particular um, painting, um, how it relates to what I'm talking about is that second Airbnb, uh, when I, you know, I stayed on the third floor, it's kind of like a vertical house, old house on a hill, vertical. Um, and then I, I was on the, in the loft section, very woody and creaky and, and um, just wonderful. And um, I think it was the second morning, first or second morning, I'm not sure, I was lying in bed and I heard this um, the sound, the sound that sounded like a rainstorm was approaching. Uh, the loud sound, you know, it really sounded like a strong sort of torrent of rain was 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 coming over the valley, and um, I sort of opened these big windows, and um, what it actually was was a train that was moving. It wasn't a steam train like this train that's here, but it was a probably an electric train moving along the river, but at the bottom of the valley. And the, the sound of the train crossing the tracks, given the shape of the valley, the long shape of the valley, and probably also the river next to it, caused the sound of this train to make this really loud whooshing sound, like rain. And because I'd already known about this particular painting, because I'd um, seen it before, because I'd already written a book on Vincent van Gogh, when when that moment happened, it really felt really magical, just totally unexpected. Um, I mean, I know I, when I opened the window, I was like, what is going on? You know, I don't see any rain. There's no storm. And then I realized there's this train going by. And, and then I really got a sense of connection to something that Van Gogh himself experienced. Obviously, he wouldn't have experienced it just with the, the um, you know, the, the train going on the tracks, but also the added bonus of that, doof, doof, you know, of, the, of a steam engine. Um, but because of the uniqueness of the the valley there, you know, the um, this Orvez, the was is like a spaghetti town. It's sort of um, stretched out of, of a long section. It's not very wide, but it's very long. Um, it's not a big town, but it, it stretches on for quite a way. And it's because of that that when I got to the Airbnb, I was a little bit too far to sort of run to the Revue Inn. Um, I suppose I could have. It would have taken probably 15, 20 minutes. But um, that kind of gives you an idea. Uh, Axie says, that came across in Loving Vincent. Yeah, you also had that in Loving Vincent. Um, so I actually have this normally hanging up in my bedroom. It, it's for some reason, the light is making it greener than it actually is. It's, it's more, I think slightly yellower than what you're seeing, seeing here. <clears throat> but funny enough, this scene also reminds me of a, um, work that my grandmother made and was hung up in my bedroom as a child that had little, carriages like that and so on. <clears throat> so that's the story behind that. Um, so I'm going to be taking you guys through um, this book. I don't know if you can see there, it refers to Orvez, right? There it is. And 
Van Gogh's finale, it refers to his last 70 days painting. Um, he, he spent 70 days basically in Norvez and he produced around about 70 artworks. And there's some question about that. Some people think that he, his output picked up and he was, he was really a machine, a, you know, is this artist a painting machine? But there's some talk that his artwork was faked, and so um, that's why there are so many artworks produced in such a short time. And guess guess who guess who is suspected of faking Van Gogh's work? Any ideas? Karina says that sounds exactly like here in the Washau Valley along the Danube River. Oh, okay. So, personally, I don't know if I agree with that. I, I, I don't know if I agree that, you know, um, half of those paintings were faked, but I think there's certainly a possibility that a handful might be. Um, and we're going to deal with that. Yeah, uh, Karina says the doctor. Uh I I have a very strong reason to believe that the portrait of Dr. Gachet, one of them, is fake. And uh, unfortunately, with the format of a live, I can't really show you, and, and you know, I don't really have the technology or um, you know some kind of editor to do that for me. But to put the two pictures side by side and explain to you why the one is authentic and why the other one isn't. And of course, it's a subjective analysis from my side as a, um, you know, someone from an artistic family and someone with an artistic eye. Um, but I might do a separate video, not a live, but a video where I, I do that, I do juxtapose them and I explain to you what's wrong with the one picture. Uh, I'm going to touch on just one thing now before we actually get into this episode. But in the um, uh, less kinetic version of Dr. Gachet, um, I th uh, maybe I should um, put a link to this so that you guys can can check it on your own time. But you can go and go into Wikipedia. And you can read the controversy about the portrait of Dr. Gachet and see both of them. So I'm just going to put a link there for you guys. I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail now, but what I want to do right now is I want to show you something. In the first version, you see a lot of those energy lines and so on. That, I believe, is the real McCoy. There's also... Um, looks like two books on the table. I also photographed that table, that orange table that um, Dr. Gachet's hand is resting on. I photographed that um, at the garden when I was in Orve, it's still there. Um, but if you go down to the second version, here's where I've got a problem with that portrait among many problems. But the main problem I've got with it is, can you see over his shoulder is like a, looks like a blue wave, right? It looks just like there's a line going across the background and it's blue separated by blue. Um, there's just absolutely no point to that. The, the blue below the line and the blue above the line are pretty much the same. They're almost the same color. And so, although technically I believe whoever painted that got that right, because the first versions also got a line going across the screen, what I think he missed was, well, in the first version, that is likely a landscape. That is likely the background is supposed to be a, hill, a hillside or just the line of the land. And although it's also kind of a blue color, the area above that is definitely the sky. And whoever painted the second version just seemed to think, oh, it's blue and I'll put a line through it. 
in other words, technically, the artist who did the second version appreciated the technicality. There's a line and there's blue, but didn't appreciate the concept that was going on, which is, okay, in the background, there's the silhouette of the horizon and the sky. Does that make sense? Do you see that? Uh, Karina says, and more detail with the foxglove. Yeah, so... I'll deal with the other problems with the two portraits in an in a individual video or possibly just on Patreon because I, I know there won't be too much interest in that on, um, on, uh, on, on, on YouTube. Um, just to give you guys an idea, it's not that there's not interest in, in Van Gogh, it's just that um, the angle I'm coming from and from true crime is certainly raising eyebrows and it's being dismissed, right? So I, earlier on, I put a link to a video from BuzzFeed and um, it's not very long um, and it's been viewed, it was put up about two years ago, it's been viewed over 9 million times. And um, as I say, some of my videos have been viewed 900 times. Um, and so it's not that there's not interest in it, um, but I've got to say, I don't know how many of you have watched that video. I'd give that video about a four out of 10. It presents the traditional version of the Van Gogh story that he cut off his ear, committed suicide, whatever, whatever, the one that we've all heard. And then it presents another story that, um, Van Gogh was actually murdered and the whole René Secretan thing, which is better, but it's also just something that's out there already. It's it's from a book by um, Nafer, Nafer and Smith and um, that was depicted in the movie Eternity's Gate. It, it's nothing, it's basically just regurgitating what we already know. It's not adding anything. And although it might have been news to some people, it's just kind of, it's almost like reading his life story in Wikipedia, you, anybody can kind of do it. Um, what I'm trying to do with this analysis is I'm trying to take a, a very credible source, someone who's an award-winning investigative journalist, someone who's very credible, and um, uh, systematically juxtapose his research with wider and deeper let's call it true crime quality investigative research. And then I'll leave it to you guys to decide um, what actually makes sense, what is reasonable, what is actually going on here. And as I said in the previous episode, for somebody to commit suicide and the gun to go missing doesn't really make any sense. We saw that in the Brian Laundry case. Initially, we didn't know where the gun was. When you found out the gun was right there, oh, okay, that, that does make sense. But it really doesn't make sense for someone to commit suicide and the gun to disappear. Um, and this is what's happened in the Van Gogh story. Also, his art material disappeared. So he apparently went painting that morning. He went out that day with his art supplies, arrived back with nothing, just bleeding, and clambered up to his bedroom and wanted to see a doctor. He, he asked to get the bullet out of his body and, and, well, we'll get to that. But the thing is, why on earth did his art supplies also disappear? What's what's that about? So, um, so, so I'm going to be dealing with Chapter 2 uh, at some length. Before I do, I want to quickly just take you through um, just some of my work how, how I started writing about artists. And it actually started with this magazine. This is the cover of it. Um, the article was um, about my great-grandfather. So, so this was the article. And that's actually my brother over there. This is a calendar that he's holding up in front of... So it's a calendar he's holding up, and what you see there is a painting he did of that mountain. So that's the painting on the calendar, and this is in, in a place called Montague in South Africa, and that is that kind of thing. And my brother's also a landscape painter. 
is also quite successful. In fact, I became a freelance in terms of writing because he was a successful artist and I quite liked his lifestyle. And so if you take both these pages together, um, I don't know if you can read that. It says two brothers go off in search of their great-grandfather. So I wrote this article. I was obviously traveling with my brother, but this was, this was kind of my idea. It was a, like a magazine didn't contact me and say, can you do this? I contacted them and I said, I'm, uh, I, you know, I can do this. I, I pitched the story and they said, well, no promises. We'll decide when we see what you do. And so these are some kind of black and white images that you can actually see him. There he is, Tennis de Jong, my great grandfather painting alongside the Victoria Falls. He's quite an adventurous guy. These are some of his etchings. Um, and um, just just a few more, you know, let me just take you through that. There, there he is with his family. Um, this, um, just see which one it is. Uh, I think this is his daughter, who is my grandmother. It's anyway, it's one of these three kids uh, was my grandmother. Um, and then there's this page as well. And then that is actually me in 2011 um, interviewing someone who knew kind of a little bit about him. So so, so kind of that, that was the article. Um, Cotton Star, good to see you here and thank you for that. Cotton Star says, the problem is that Gachet and his son Paul controlled the narrative of Van Gogh's death for over 70 years. Yeah, they not only controlled that, they controlled the archive of quite a lot of his work and then they sort of released it. So, you know, that that's why the question is, is it any surprise that the most famous Van Gogh artwork is the portrait of Dr. Gachet. Well, Dr. Gachet had to be pretty happy about that. But it, it's a great point. Um, and the more you go into Dr. Gachet and his son, the more um, you sort of, the plot thickens. And we're going to deal with some of that now. I think there's a second chapter on Dr. Gachet after the next one. So chapter four also deals, I think specifically with the portrait of Dr. Gachet. So um, I just wanna snipe a little bit. Um, this magazine doesn't exist anymore. And so I'm, I guess I'm allowed to say this, otherwise I wouldn't do it. But when this article came out, I was really not happy um, uh, because the, the, this particular cover image, I believe is actually fake. It's um, you know, the, the image of the flowers is one image and the image of the bicycle ride is another image. And I just personally don't like that. I don't like photoshopping things, especially for a magazine cover. You can see there's not really any shadow there. Um, I could be wrong. Maybe it's not photoshopped, but to me it looks photoshopped. And um, so, so I didn't really like the fact that this article on my grandfather's art appeared in this particular edition with this not great cover. Um, the other thing was that there were problems with the article itself. The editor, um, although I gave her the right image numbers, she made mistakes with the um, actual images. And so one kind of silly example, I guess, is this image here uh, was the wrong image that she put in. Um, just a couple of little niggles that I wasn't too happy about. And I came very close to saying, you know what, if you're going to do that with my work, then, then I'm not going to provide you with any more. You know, if you're going to spoil uh, the quality that I'm sending you, that's just how I felt. I'm not going to um, do anything again. Um and then I kind of, you know, things were actually a lot worse than that. There were there were moments where she was threatening to torpedo my work. Um, I don't know, I won't go into all of it, uh, but it was very unfair what was going on. And I, in the end, just kind of swallowed my pride as you kind of do have to as a freelancer. And then I ended up writing about another dozen articles on freelancers. It was kind of quite a good break. 
Um, and at uh, that stage, I wasn't writing books. This came out in April 2011. And this this is kind of a, just a chronology of some of the articles. This one, much better cover, uh, came out um, July 2012. I'm not going to take you through it but it was on so this one actually made got a mention on the cover Clara wrote another artist um, and then and that's from July 2012 then I did this one in February 2012 another nice cover so it just happened to be my grandfather's work that got a really crappy cover um, and not even mentioned on it but anyway Pirine of Country this also got a mention on the on the main cover. I'm not going to take you through these articles. We just don't really have that much time. Um, if you guys really want me to, I can show you. But um, uh, this was February 2012. Lovely cover, that one. Um, uh, January 2013, this one. Also a nice cover. And this is... Um, I don't think it mentions anything about the artist that I did, but this happened to be a pretty good article again Peter Wenning um, each each article is around about six pages or so so this one came out in January 2013 I don't know if you guys know um, that was the time that Oscar Pistorius shot Reva Sienkamp right so I was writing all these articles These I was obviously doing lots of other magazine work as well not just these articles I was surviving as a freelancer so I was having to do um, I was having to do um, to work really um, quickly to, in order to make a living to pay my rent to eat so I was writing sometimes three or publishing three articles a month in magazines uh, sometimes more sometimes less so in the so this article came out J January 2013. And then this one came out February um, 2013. So the same month, so there's an article on Oscar Pistorius, the same month that that Reva was shot, this article actually appeared in the magazine. That, that is pretty fast work. Um, I think this magazine came out um, every second week. So I think it was a bi-weekly, that's the word, or bi-monthly. It comes out twice in a month. Um, yeah, so bi-monthly, I guess. Um, this is dated the 28th of February. And so the article on Oscar Pistorius um, I wrote for this, a financial magazine. I've been writing other articles for them. And it was actually originally titled The Rise and Fall of Oscar Pistorius. So you can see how the analysis and study of artists sort of um, and the, the detail of their backstories um, went into true crime, if that makes sense. I was doing this, um, I do go and research these people, I do source photos from art galleries um, and do all this work, and, and that seamlessly kind of went into true crime in a way. So anyway, so that led to this article, and then I, then I, the next, the next um, art-related publication was January 2014 um, on um, Thomas Baines. I really enjoyed this one. One of the first artists to, well, the very first artist to depict the Victoria Falls. His, his art is also worth a fortune. Um, and then, what's the date of this one? May 2014, a few months later, I published a, an, another article on the Oscar Pistorius thing in this magazine, Marie Claire, um, Reva Stian Camp in her own words. And that was actually my first book on in true crime, Reva in her own words, um, which actually started off as a magazine article. That's, so that was the first book I wrote, and I would go on to write another 100 after that. And then um, September 2014, um, also in Country Life, um, not quite sure what I published in the uh, the art of bonsai. This is also qu quite a good one. So maybe on another day when there's less to go through, I'll show you some of the articles, just you know, like the pictures, and just quickly show you. But I don't think we've got too much time now. I don't want to 
take too much time to to get to our analysis. Um, I see we're at the 35-minute mark, so I want to kind of get started. Um, Sharon Tuck says, thanks a lot for that. Yeah, there are, I think, 20 audiobooks on Patreon at the moment. Um, so um, I've gotten a bit slow with the audiobooks. A lot's kind of going on, but there are at least 20, so that's something. Uh, I think I'm halfway through two other audiobooks that, that I really need to wrap up. A little bit difficult to do that when you're having these having things like load shedding and there's construction going on outside my home right not right now but now. Um, uh, thanks, guys. I, I'm, I'll maybe um, take some photos of these articles and put it on Patreon. You know um, that that might be better. Um, Harriet says I just ordered his book on Vincent. Whose book? <laughs> hope it's my book but um, yeah it is a this is a book worth worth reading you're going to find out a lot um, it's it is a beautiful book definitely is and we're going to deal with it right now uh, Axie says you experience the dilemma of the artists and the people who profit from their work yeah uh, how this all ended was um, I, uh, I said to the editor, the editor wanted me to, to put a change in a story um, and I didn't really want to do that. Um, you know, I was happy to do a lot of things, but she wanted me to put a very, um, I don't want to actually say it because this video could actually be demonetized if I say that word, but she wanted to put a really um, salacious stuff into a particular story, it was about an artist who, who was quite a um, hedonist, I guess, and I just didn't feel that I wanted to go there in the article. I wanted to be about the art. I didn't want it to be about that stuff. And uh, so I, I kind of just said to her, look, if you really want that in there, you, why don't you put it in there? You, the editor, just put it in there. And then she didn't want to do that. And then once again, she threatened to nix the entire article. Now, bear in mind, I had to drive somewhere, take photos, write the article, do everything. And based on that one thing, she was prepared to nix the entire article, just throw it away. And I thought, wow, I've written 13 articles for you. I've done all this work. And you prepared to still treat me like trash. And then I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm not writing another article for you. And then I, I was actually contacted by the manager of the, um, what do you call it, the, I think the publication manager, so the, so she's the editor, so the person who is kind of higher up in the, I won't say begging me to continue, but, but really, you know, asking me nicely, please keep going, because I was starting to get a lot of feedback from their readers and getting a lot of, um, interest and so on, but I kind of had enough. I was like, you know, I'm a freelancer. Um, if you, after all this time, you don't respect me, um, I can really take my work somewhere else. And I've really enjoyed being a self-published author because I, I haven't had to deal with um, these editors who think that they are tyrants and dictators, that think that they can snap their fingers and, and you will do backflips for them. I did that for a really, really long time. And you, you think that eventually they're going to reach a point where they, you know, really appreciate your work and they, you know, show that. It doesn't really happen. They're used to treating freelancers like um, the way they do. So um, they're not my favorite people in the world. But fortunately, um, fortunately, you know, I had to make a choice at one point. Are you going to stick with magazine writing or write books? And most people would say, you're not going to make any money from books. Don't write books. You're going to be a poor artist like Vincent van Gogh. You're going to work yourself to, to the bone and you're going to have nothing. And um, I kind of backed myself and um, so far it's worked out. So I'm, so I'm pretty happy about that decision. Uh, Axie says she was trying to sell soap. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, so that's that story. So, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of often said that I've, I've sometimes really identified with Vincent van Gogh, um, his struggle, um, you know, because I'm a, someone who's literally living my creativity. 
and um, I have struggled for, for a long time. I'm obviously older than he was. He was 37 when he died. If I died at 37, I think you could have said, well, you know, um, there wasn't really much success there. But I think in the last 13 years, I've definitely, um, you know, enjoyed uh, some recognition and maybe Van Gogh would have had the same. If he'd had just a few more years, maybe he would have enjoyed recognition and success and that satisfaction in his lifetime. But for example, in my work on Van Gogh, which I feel strongly about, I don't feel like I'm getting any recognition. Um, like I said, I went to the Van Gogh Museum, not interested in talking to you, um, and so on and so on. So um, I think one's got to keep trying and pick your battles, and, and I guess this is one of them. Um, okay, so we're going to get going now with the analysis of, um, of this book, and we're starting on page 31, which is dealing with Guess Who. <clears throat> So I don't know if you guys know, do you know what is the most, <coughs> do you guys know what is the most um, famous and expensive painting Van Gogh ever produced? Do you know what the answer is to that? It's not Starry Night, it's the portrait of Dr. Gachet. That is what has sold the most money ever. And I think there's, that's not a coincidence. So here we go. Um, chapter two of Martin Bailey's book deals with the famous, or is that infamous, Dr. Gachet. I say infamous because it's my belief that if Vincent van Gogh was murdered, Dr. Gachet was his murderer. I don't know if you need me to say that again. My belief is that Vincent van Gogh was murdered, right? And you can't just say, okay, he didn't commit suicide, he was murdered. Well, who murdered him? Dr. Gachet. What is his motive? We're going to get to that. The other version of this is that Vincent van Gogh was killed by accident. They say that he was murdered, but that's not murder. He was killed by accident by some youths, and you, you see that depicted in the movie At Eternity's Gate. Um, I think that's a ridiculous story um, for many reasons, um, but that certainly does explain better why the gun was missing and why his art was sort of secreted away as well. That would explain that. Um, uh, they don't provide any motive in, it's just a complete freak accident in terms of Naifa and Smith's story. So it's a freak accident, there's no motive, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I've taken a lot of their research, which is excellent, but it, it only goes up to a certain point and then it peters out because they don't know about true crime. They don't know how to work with forensic evidence they don't have that experience. They've got the experience in, in other areas. And um, so in a way, I'm, I've kind of been standing on their shoulders and saying, okay, um, thanks for that backstory. That's that's useful. But in terms of the true crime elements, you guys kind of are amateurs. And in terms of when I read um, Nafa and Smith's version, I think it was a, a paragraph, a paragraph or two paragraphs, a section of text that much dealing with Van Gogh's death. I mean, it's I write books dealing with, you know, a moment or um, a photograph, like Christmas Star, John Bonnet Ramsey, it was a book basically written around one new image released. So anyway, the point being, um, you can't just say Vincent Van Gogh didn't commit suicide. If he didn't commit suicide, then what? Well, if you say it was murdered, you need to identify a murderer and have a motive. And I feel like I've done that. I didn't set out when I when I did my research, I didn't set out to find a murderer. I set out to figure out, did he cut off his ear? 
And what was going on with his condition? Was he truly mad? Was he truly troubled? I thought I figured that out, and I thought it was related to syphilis, not to mental instability. And then the third aspect was, did he commit suicide? And I, I thought I was going to disprove that he committed suicide, not find his murderer, and that was what shocked me. I didn't expect to find someone with a motive and also find um, a scenario. So, so anyway, coming back to uh, Bailey's book, I found the optics of Bailey's second chapter intriguing in, in kind of two respects. Firstly, there are two portraits of Dr. Gachet. So the author, right, the guy writing this book, he can make a choice between those two portraits of Dr. Gachet. So I can tell you, if, if it was up to me, if, if I was writing the book or if I was writing a magazine article and they said, um, we need a, a painting of, of Gachet in, in our article, which one should we use? Well, I know which one I would have suggested, the first version. The ones with those energy lines, right? That's not the one that Martin Bailey uses. Martin Bailey uses the one that I believe is the fake version, the second version. Why? You know, why is this art expert using the, uh, let's call it the disputed version? Now, you can see a conspiracy in that, but it may not be. He might, he might prefer it or for whatever reason. Um, I believe that painting was actually painted long after Van Gogh's death by Dr. Gachet himself. Um, another aspect that I can highlight that is very different between the two pictures are the eyes of the subject. And let me put the ball in your court. Imagine if someone had painted a not terribly flattering portrait of you, right? So it, it's kind of nice. You you like the way you, you're sitting and you like the flowers or whatever, but your expression, so everything about the painting is quite cool except your expression. You sort of look morose. You look a certain way. And so you have the opportunity to redo the, it's almost like taking another selfie, to redo the portrait, but this time fix the parts you don't like. So it's almost like photoshopping a selfie. So in this case, um, the, the one of the big changes between the one painting and the other are the eyes. And, and often we're very particular about our eyes. No, my eyes are that color. Haven't you ever looked at a photo and, and there's, there's red by your eyes or something like that, or your eyes are closed and you notice that? Well, the same could apply in a painting. And I think that the doctor did have very light blue eyes and he wanted his eyes because eyes are like the windows to your soul, but also eyes are like a sign of your, remember he's a doctor, of your wisdom, your intelligence, your your philosophy, your, you know, your kind of whether you are, you know, a sensible dude. And so the portrait of Dr. Gachet that I believe is fake, there's quite a lot of attention to the eyes. The eyes are lighter and there's less of that hangdog look around them, right? Oh, Stephanie's here. Good to see you, Stephanie. So um, I, I believe that the second painting of Dr. Gachet was painted by Dr. Gachet himself. You might think, wow, well, where did you come up with that? There's a lot of reason to believe that that was going on because he was an amateur artist. He was copying works anyway that was quite well known. He was a collector. He was very. He was a. He, he wanted to become a well-known artist. And one of the reasons why Van Gogh, why welcomed Van, Van Gogh into his home, was because he wanted to learn how to paint. He wanted to be sort of. Uh, he wanted a painter in his space, um, so that he could kind of intern in a way, right? And this whole idea of Van Gogh dying and then his art supplies disappearing, where do you think they ended up? I mean, if you're going to fake a Van Gogh, it's going to help if you've got his paint, you've got his, some of his canvases um, and that kind of thing, right? Um, the other thing just to bear in mind is when Van Gogh died, we're jumping a little bit ahead of the gun, but when he died, um, at his funeral, the doctor sort of walked off with like a whole bunch of his paintings and he kind of said, no, I'm taking this as payment for my services. You know, I 
treated him and so I'm taking these paintings as payment and th th it wasn't clear how many paintings he took but it to me it seemed a bit exorbitant especially since he failed as his as his doctor you know Dr. Geshe was supposed to help Vincent van Gogh and within two and a half months van Gogh was dead oh but I still want a lot of payment for my wonderful doctoring it's also quite interesting you know they talk about doctoring an artwork or doctoring a document kind of thing you know what I mean and here's a doctor. So just think about that. Um, so I I wouldn't put it past possibility that this fake, in my opinion, portrait of Dr. Gesho was actually painted with Van Gogh's own brushes or some of his own equipment. Just something to bear in mind. So the second surprise, so, so, so first of all, the first surprise in Bailey's book, in my opinion, is that he chooses, um, where is it now? He chooses this version of Dr. Gachet, right? I wouldn't have chosen that one. So that's also an area where you can say, I disagree with you. Why couldn't he use that version? And you might be right. Why couldn't he use that version? Um, it's also an opportunity for you to say, I see where you're coming from. Um, I can't really explain it, but I would have used the first version. I would have used the one that's more idiosyncratic, that's got those energy lines that just feels like it's a genuine Van Gogh. I wouldn't use the disputed version. Why would you, as an art expert, art historian, do that, right? So that's the first surprise. The second surprise in his second chapter was this quote from Vincent himself in regards to his murderer, in my opinion. So it starts chapter two, the eclectic doctor. I also wouldn't have called it that. I would have called it the eccentric doctor, Put a little bit of a ominous spin on, on, on him. Eclectic just sounds like he's innocently funny, strange, peculiar. Under that, he's got the following quote. I've found, and it's, it's taking Vincent van Gogh's words from his letter um, and, and um, using them kind of as a quote. And so he says, I've found in Dr. Gachet a ready-made friend and something like a new brother. How's that? I mean, it's <laughs> it's um, it's a gr it's a glowing endorsement, you know. Um, he's barely met this guy, and and he's like a new brother to him. Awesome. Um, and that is that the of all the things that Bailey could choose to say about Dr. Gachet using Vincent's words, he uses that absolutely glowing endorsement. Now, now, take the glowing endorsement and the second version of Dr. Gachet. It's also a glowing endorsement of that. Um, you know, I don't have any problem with this second portrait. Okay, there you go. Well, I've also got a problem with this glowing endorsement of Dr. Gachet, um, that he was this ready-made friend and something like a new brother. Really, was he? And we're going to use, don't take my word for it, we're going to use Vincent's own words to test this, to test what he really thought of Dr. Gachet. And I, you know what? You, you can, uh, we can really simplify this. Um, you can say, you know what? I, I don't really want to hear any more of what you've got to say. And I, I appreciate that attitude where you say, you know what? What do you know? What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the first version, I'm going to look at the portrait of Dr. Gachet myself, and I'm going to decide, what do you think Vincent thought of the doctor when he painted the painting? I mean, he's painting, he's not just painting Dr. Gachet, he's, he's interpreting a person, and he's kind of saying what he thinks about Dr. Gachet. You might think, do artists do that? Well, if you look at when Dr., when, sorry, when, um, Vincent van Gogh painted Paul Gauguin in all while he painted him in a certain way. When he painted the chairs representing himself and Dr. and uh, Gauguin, 
he represented himself and Gogo in a certain way. He was certainly saying a lot about that. And, and conversely, when Paul Gogo painted his portrait of Vincent, it, it's really not particularly flattering. It's really not a flattering, uh, um, it doesn't look like a, a, a nice person. Um, so if you were Van Gogh, you, you, you should be quite stung by that impression. And so I think Dr. Gachot was quite stung by Vincent van Gogh's impression of him, hence the second portrait. But my question to you is, you can take all everything we're saying away and go and look at the portrait of Dr. Gachet yourself and say, what do you think Vincent's trying to say there? Do you think he's trying to say, this is a nice guy that is like a ready-made friend? I mean, he's going like this. And his eyes are sort of, I don't know what they, his eyes are doing. But there's actually green streaks, green little lines around his eye, which is symbolic of envy, right? And that is exactly how he felt. He was envious of these other artists. He wanted to be, have that same prestige and atmosphere and vibe around him as, as like a famous artist. And of course, he was, he was no good. He, he just, you know, some people just can't, um, you know, um, develop themselves in that. I, I personally don't believe it. I don't believe you can't, but some people, some people don't. Um, so I do think it is really high praise that, that Bailey puts in his sort of under his chapter, you know, saying, um, that this guy was like a new brother to me, really. So in his portrait, is he really representing that? This guy's a great friend. Um, it doesn't look like that in his portrait, right? So as far as Bailey's concerned, the Doctor appears to be the least suspicious character in the story. But forget about what Bailey says or what I say. What did Van Gogh himself say about Gachet in his letters to his brother? And so... I refer you guys to the generic Wikipedia page. So you might say this book is biased or you might say my book is biased. Often Wikipedia is just generic. It's just the, you know, the, they take the cream off what is known about something and, you know, in terms, if you take true crime and you, and you find out the true crime Wikipedia page is often just the mainstream view, just a very general view of stuff, the vanilla version. And so the vanilla version of um, the very basic fact of Van Gogh's first impression of Dr. Gachet is that it was unfavorable. It's mentioned on Wikipedia, right? So Van Gogh's first version of Dr. Gachet was unfavorable, and yet you've got this glowing endorsement in Bailey's book. Let me just put that in another way. Do you think... Van Gogh's impression of the doctor is favorable based on his portrait of the doctor, based on the doctor kind of doing that. Does, is that like a favorable way of looking at someone? It doesn't necessarily mean it's not. It just is something worth considering. Um, so let me quote from Wikipedia from the portrait of Dr. Gachet. It's written here, Vincent van Gogh's first impression of Gachet was unfavorable. Writing to Theo, he remarked, and this is quoting from his own letter, I think that we must not count on Dr. Gachet at all. First of all, he's sicker than I am, I think, or shall we say just as much. So that's that. Now, when one blind man leads another blind man, don't they both fall in the ditch? However, in a letter dated two days later to their sister, so... To his brother, he says, Dr. Gachet is sick. But to his sister, he says, you know what? I found a true friend in Dr. Gachet, something like another brother. So much so we resemble each other physically and also mentally. So why is there this difference? Why does Vincent say one thing to his brother and another thing to his sister? I think there are a couple of possibilities. I think the one possibility is to his brother, he could be honest and sincere and genuine. His brother knew him and he, he'd just seen his brother and his brother was supporting him. And I think he just had a more real relationship with his brother. Bear in mind also his brother had met Dr. Gachet, right? 
Um, it could it could also be that he wanted to. Um, how can I put it? Dr. Gesher was supposed to take care of Vincent. Perhaps Vincent wanted more of his brother's companionship. And so he's kind of saying, you know what, this guy is not going to work. Meaning, kind of implying, okay, you come and you come and see me. You come and, you know, um, I don't know, help me on the road to recovery. Um, I don't know if that's really what I believe. I, I think the reason he told Wilhelmina that he'd found a friend was because I think she had the impression that and I, and I think her sisters, also his sisters, kind of had the impression that he, he couldn't get along with anyone. Bear in mind, he just had this huge bust up with Paul Gauguin, which caused this huge scandal. And so, you know, it's like Vincent doesn't have any friends. Vincent's hard to get along with. Vincent's this, Vincent's that. And so he's kind of holding up his relationship with Dr. Gachet as something more than it really is. You know, um, he's my friend. Well, actually not but that's what he's doing. And so with Theo, he can kind of criticize him because he's, he's kind of got Theo as his friend. I'm just saying, I think he was overstating things to Wilhelmina because th there was a little bit of a sense of Vincent as the black sheep and he was causing trouble wherever he went and all that kind of thing. Does that make sense? That's how I interpret that. Um, you know, he, he also talks about, I think he's really overstating it. He says, you know, I found a true friend in Dr. Gachet. And, you know, he's so much like me that we even look like each other, really. Do you think that they look like each other? I don't. I, I don't think they look at all like one another. They've got, I think, reddish hair, um, but I don't, I don't think they really look like each other. So um, let me just look at some of your comments. Um, Harriet says he looks ill. Uh, Karina, yeah, that's true about the blind leading the blind. Uh, Jean says the doctor looks dim, as in unintelligent. He probably didn't like that. He probably didn't like that he he didn't look very sharp. Does he doesn't look very sharp? Does he? Um, I don't know if Stephanie. I don't know if you meant to write mere pleasantries, but yeah. Actually says, is that foxglove flowers on the table? Foxglove is a treatment for heart problems. You, you know your stuff. I actually grew foxglove in my garden. At, at, I had a, the one was a giant. It was like a really big plant, and the other one next to it was a bit of a disappointment. But I don't know if you know, foxglove are toxic from um, head to toe. Uh, the flowers are toxic. The seeds are toxic. The leaves are toxic. And so... Um, I don't think Van Gogh knew this, and I, I don't even think that the doctor knew this, but it does make you wonder. Here, yeah, Vincent is drawing a doctor, and on the table, kind of almost in his hands, is a poisonous plant, which was typically being um, prescribed under certain conditions. It, and that definitely is a foxglove. So... Um, Foxglove is definitely an interesting part of the story as well. And uh, it's not really something that Bailey even mentions, which is bizarre. You'd think that you would really get into it. Um, I might be jumping the gun because there's another chapter on that. So we'll see if he does get into it. Um, Thimble Finger Hut. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Um, something about Foxglove. Um you know, if you think about it, it's quite a funny name for a flower, foxglove, right? Now, once again, you can go to the Wikipedia and just get the generic um, information around it. And, and they talk about um, it coming out of Old English and folk myths. And uh, let me just read what it says here. Folk myths obscured the literal origins of the name insinuating that foxes wore the flowers on their paws to silence their movements as they stealthily hunted their auvers is, is a very woody hillside. The woody hillsides where the foxes made their dens were often covered with the toxic flowers. Um, uh, 
So I think that's quite interesting that literally fox gloves you often found around the dens of foxes. Um, but did you know that the other names for fox glove were witch's glove? That's another name. And uh, that, again, refers to the toxicity of, of this particular plant. So, but just think about that, this idea of um, a fox putting these um, these gloves on its paw so that it can stealthily hunt its prey. And then you have Dr. Gachet's hands right next to these fox gloves. And what I'm insinuating, I'm not even insinuating, I'm accusing him of uh, the murder of Vincent van Gogh. I, I think it's quite a interesting, um, it's interesting symbolically, I think. I'm not saying that Van Gogh purposefully was doing that. I just think it's quite interesting on this side of time. That's all. Yeah, doctor, the doctor was the fox. That's what we. That's what I'm trying to get at. So let me go through this. Um, what, what could also have changed? So uh, you know, uh, Van Gogh wrote his brother saying, "What did he say? You know that we shouldn't count on him." And then to his sister that, wow, this guy's awesome. It is possible that in the space of two days, there could have been a change, that, that Vincent, Vincent himself may have had a change of heart, a different impression. That's also possible. It could be that both his impressions were, were accurate, that on the one hand, he felt, wow, you can't count on this guy. This guy's a weirdo. And on the other hand, he found, wow, he's actually quite a nice guy. You know, you may have had both of those, and they're both, to some extent, true. So, so here are a few possibilities that could have led to this change. And again, you've got to know these people in order to see these possibilities. So, it's possible that perhaps both of these characters, Vincent and Dr. Gachet, took a while to warm up to one another. Bear in mind, can you imagine what it's like meeting Vincent van Gogh for the first time? He doesn't have an ear. Um, he is a bit scruffy looking. He maybe even smells. He's not very socialized. So it might be like, wow, are, are you like a, a good good artist? You you don't look like much kind of thing. And from Vincent van Gogh's perspective, he encounters this doctor that seems a bit depressed, seems a bit odd and... You know, his home's like dark and filled with skulls and it's a bit dreary. You know, he hasn't come to Orvez for dreariness. He's come for color and vibrancy and life and so on. He's sort of thinking, I don't know if I'm going to get that here. That might have been his first impression. And so I wonder whether Van Gogh didn't change his tune, didn't have a different feeling about everything when he encountered the doctor's 20-year-old daughter, Marguerite, who may have been 21. You know, when he when he sees the doctor's daughter, does he maybe not feel, well, I think I want to come back here. <laughs> I think I want to, um, I'd like to see her again, or I'd, I'd like the opportunity to sort of um, become more familiar so that I can talk to her. Bear in mind he's been completely single and completely alone for quite a long time. He was very lonely in the yellow house, didn't seem to have a girlfriend, he hasn't had a girlfriend for a long time. Then he's in the asylum and it's quite difficult for this guy without an ear to fraternize. In, I'm talking about in a kind of a social way. Uh, and I'm sure he's sort of desperate to do that. Is there an age gap? Yes. Is it an, an inappropriate scenario? Yes. Um, but at this, in this scenario, you can come to fairly close quarters with with her. Maybe say a few words to her, and um, you know, maybe it makes his day. You know, maybe he's like, "Wow, uh, she's so beautiful." Whatever. Uh, maybe she's she's quite sweet to him. And is that what changed his tune? Right. Um, and again, you might say, well, I think you're projecting. Well, I think that's a bit of a strange thing to think or to say. But the fact is that 
Van Gogh, I think, painted painted her portrait, Marguerite's portrait, more than he painted Dr. Gachet, especially if you say that second portrait is fake, there's only one portrait of Dr. Gachet, then I think you could argue that theoretically he painted Marguerite twice as much or three times as much as Dr. Gachet. He was more interested in painting her than he was in him. And I don't know, if it was me, I, I think I would feel the same way. I'd rather paint um, her. I'd rather photograph her than the doctor, um, you know. Um, I don't know if she was particularly beautiful, but um, she was young and she was, um, I think, a breath of fresh air. I don't, I don't know if the doct Dr. Gachet, I mean, if you take Van Gogh's words, you know, where he said, um, he's sicker than I am and um, one blind man leading another blind man. Do you, do you want to really paint that guy? Do you want to hang out with that guy? Do you want to have conversations with that guy? It's possible that his daughter was, um, as I say, softer and more you know, easy on the eye and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's something that's definitely underestimated with Van Gogh is that he's a man with a man's impulses, a man's desires a man's thoughts, a man's feelings, that aspect, you know, you, you think of him as a troubled artist. How much do you think of him just as a as a man, as a 37-year-old bachelor, right? That's why I want to write a, another book, The Mistresses of Vincent van Gogh, so as a follow-up to The Murder of Vincent van Gogh. And if you, you, as I say, if you don't understand his previous love life, which is pretty crazy, pretty chaotic, pretty embarrassing, you know, there have been so many scandals, you know, his family are, the, the, you know, very, um, um, what's the word? Um, they're Protestants, but his own father was a minister, so very um, well-to-do, and he, you know, was um, Vincent edifying their name kind of thing, you know? Um Axie says the doctor had training but no talent. That's true. Uh, Karina says this is what I think too. Marguerite, yeah. She was the draw. Uh, Karina says I only know the ones in the garden and on the patio of her. I must look for others. Stephanie says, oh, that would be amazing. I'm not, are you referring to these articles? So the, 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 he painted a picture of her playing the piano. And he spent a lot of time on that. He, he didn't only paint that portrait of Marguerite, he also sketched it quite a few times to his brother. Um, and then there was also Marguerite in the garden. Um, I'm not sure if there's another figure of her, um, but why I say there, there are three um, portraits of her, the third is a bit of a, using a bit of license, um, kind of the, the last the last sort of word on Marguerite was that Vincent had said he, he, he's going to ask that he can paint your portrait again, right? So we know that he painted her by the piano. We know that he painted her in the garden. And then there was the intention to paint her again. And I don't know whether he had to ask her father if he could paint her, probably. Um, and... That never happened. So we know that he wanted to paint her portrait a third time. I personally believe that plays into the events of his murder, of Vincent van Gogh's murder, that he wanted to paint her portrait. And But anyway, we'll get to that. Uh, Stephanie says, for you to write a second book someday would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, well, not anytime soon. Um, I'm definitely in a new space for now. And I, I, if five years go by before I write another book, it will be great. Um, Ten years even would also be good. Um, I, I hope not to write another book before I'm 60. So I'm holding thumbs for that. Um, but yeah, I, I would like to write The Mistresses of Vincent van Gogh and I would like to complete a few other true crime series. Casey Anthony, Scott Peterson, um, uh, West Memphis 3, there are quite a few that I, that I would like to 
complete what I what I started out. Um, so again, there I'm feeling a bit like Van Gogh. There's so much work I want to do. Um, it would really be a good thing if in 10 years from now, um, I've got a thousand reviews on the murder of Vincent Van Gogh and people are clamoring, please write another book. That would be awesome. To be honest, I do not see that happening, but maybe a couple of series like this will get a bit more traction and interest because I really do think there's substance to what we're talking about here. Um, so, yeah, so Marguerite, I think, is a factor in the story. And again, you might say, well, I think you're reaching. I, I don't think she's relevant at all. Well, there, there's also a young girl at the Revue Inn, and Vincent van Gogh also painted her several times. And the, the cool thing with um, uh, the, the, the girl that he painted at the Revue Inn was that she, she was a little girl when he painted her, so she gave interviews many years later about what that was like and what Vincent van Gogh was like and, uh, you know, what happened to those artworks and, you know, what the experience was like of, of the portrait being painted. And he painted a couple of her. Um, you could definitely make the argument because I don't think it's a terribly flattering portrait of her. It's a, quite a terrible execution. Um, you could say that Van Gogh's depiction of Dr. Gachet isn't necessarily showing him to be morose or whatever. It's actually Van Gogh's not a great artist. Um, I don't know if I buy that, but one thing I will say is the portrait of, um, uh, what's her name, Adeline Revu is not, I think even she was like, well, what have you done? I mean, it doesn't look anything like it. There's almost like not a face there. You know, what is that? And I, I must have feel that way about, it's not like I'm Van Gogh's biggest fan. Some of his artwork I like, like like this one, but there's a whole bunch of his art that I think is terrible. I, I don't think it's really good art at all. Often his depictions of of people walking or farming a field are very amateurish and terrible. So, but what I find quite amazing with his art is, is that you have these flourishes of mastery and magic like Starry Night, like Wheatfield with Crows. You have these sudden master strokes, you know, where the art is just stunning. And then, as I say, you've got these other, other art works that are horrible, just, you know, I wouldn't hang them on my wall, you know. If someone gave it to me, I'd say, thanks a lot, sell it and take the money. I wouldn't, wouldn't hang it on my wall kind of thing. Um, Let's just look at some of your questions. Um, Karina, you're absolutely right. You say we are getting towards a motive. We absolutely are. Don't forget that Vincent very likely had syphilis. And yeah, you've got a doctor and you've got a young young daughter who never married, by the way, and um, Dr. Gachet, and they're actually two children. There's Marguerite and her younger brother, Paul. Paul is 16 years old. He also features in some of the murkiness around forgeries and so on. Um, but um, there's no mother. There's no sort of mother hen that is sort of checking up on the kids. What, you know, what's my daughter doing? Who's my daughter hanging out with? And bear in mind, the doctor has got to work. The doctor's got to go into Paris. He's leaving his kids at home. And what's happening? Vincent is kind of, the doctor said, you welcome to come over whenever. Come over, paint, do your thing. And so there would have been occasions where Vincent comes to the house and the doctor's not there. And guess who is there? And is, is that so terrible? And if the house is a bit dingy, I'm talking about the inside being kind of depressing and dark, and we'll get to that, there's skulls and stuff lying there. Um, do you, you know, the, the other things that are more interesting perhaps, right? Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is 
just from his art, and I think that's such an important area to base your analysis on, his art and his letters. He seemed quite interested in Marguerite. He, he was painting her. He was expressing the intention to paint her again. Dr. Gachet, not so much. There's a etching that that is that is attributed to Van Gogh. Um, I wonder if it's in this book. Um, so there's a etching attributed to Van Gogh um, of Dr. Gachet smoking his pipe. I believe that is fake as well. Um, and etchings was another area that um, the doctor kind of got into. I, I, I said it's not part of this chapter. I wonder if it's not part of the next chapter on Van Gogh. I would like to show it to you guys. Let me just see if I can bring it up here. Oh, here it is. So, first of all, there is the... So, there is the uh, painting of uh, Marguerite in the garden, right? This is a separate chapter. And you can almost imagine that Van Gogh is in the garden and he's just trying to paint the garden and Marguerite's at home and, you know, Vincent's been painting for quite a while and Marguerite doesn't want to sort of stay at home. So she kind of goes out into the garden. Maybe she's got to water the garden. Maybe she's got to pick some flowers for, for lunch or something. And so she strays into Van Gogh's space and he probably likes it. And... You know, him painting her in the garden is almost like the middle ground between painting a landscape and painting a portrait. He doesn't necessarily have to ask her permission. Maybe he did ask her permission, maybe not. And so if he does paint her portrait, she's going to be spending more time looking at her, him painting her. She's going to be more engaged with his work, right? So um, this is the etching that is attributed to Van Gogh and I just don't believe that that is is genuine either that's um, not the portrait of Dr. Gachet but a etching of Dr. Gachet smoking a pipe, to me it just doesn't look like the kind of um, technique that um, he uses one thing you do see in this etching are eyes that look quite haunted and his mouth looks kind of crooked and so on. Uh, it, it doesn't look like quite a, um, uh, I don't want to say straight, it looks kind of like a disturbed individual, doesn't he? But this particular etching, I don't, I personally don't think Van Gogh did. Maybe he did, I don't know. What do you guys think? Let's just uh, look at some of your comments, uh, Almond Blossoms. I'm not sure what you're saying, a link to. Sharon says, oh, this is also fascinating. Really is, really is fascinating. Um, Stephanie, thanks for putting a link up to my book on Van Gogh. Um, Karina says I'm with you concerning his art I just dare, didn't say it uh, Stephanie says it seems more detailed than his other portraits not the same style Terry Terry you made it didn't I think Terry even took off work to to be here so I really appreciate that Terry I think you're in the UK right anyway good to see you here Terry actually says interesting that the doctor was into etching remember etching means you can print the same things over and over and over again and so and that's what happened with my great grandfather uh, that's a great way to 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 mass produce fakes. You know, it's a great way to make money off the apparently genuine art of somebody, you know, things like etchings and prints and that kind of thing. Okay, so let's keep going. Wow, I see we already have an hour 24. So I think I need to 
pick up the pace a little bit. Um, so there's another reason why I thought it was quite odd that the fake portrait of Dr. Gersh, just my opinion, right? It's not like official that it's fake. Um, there's controversy surrounding it. If you go and read the Wikipedia link, you'll see that there is. Um, but anyway, I, I, another reason I thought it was kind of odd that this fake portrait of Dr. Gersh was shown, chosen to showcase Bailey's second chapter has to do with when I was at the Gachet residence in May 2019. And I can't really show you um, what I put on Patreon, but I took a couple of photos from standing like right in front of the house. And so um, what I tried to direct my patrons' attention to was you know, so it's a, you're standing kind of in the road in front of the house. It's got quite a high wall, and you see the house behind it. The house, I must say, looks a lot like the house I stayed in um, further up the road uh, on the hillside where I heard the train going, going by. It looks a, a lot similar, but I, I must say I preferred the house I stayed in. It was just more airy and, and I don't know, the whole thing. But anyway, so um, in this photo of that I took in the road in Orvez, um, you know, in the front of the house, there's something to the, the side of the entrance. And so if you look closer, you see kind of a green, um, uh, what do they call it? Um, not a scaffolding. I know what I want to say, I just can't think of the word. Um, what do you call that when you have art and it's it's kind of constructed on something? Um, I, can't, I just can't think of the word at the moment. Anyway, so you've got this um, uh, green sort of structure, almost like two poles, and it's kind of holding up a, um, a kind of a board probably made of metal, and on the board is a print of Dr. Gachet, it, the portrait of Dr. Gachet, it's the painting, and guess which one it is? Which painting of Dr. Gachet do you think is showcasing Dr. Gachet's home? No, not a mural. Um, I think oh, it's called an installation. Yeah, it's probably not even the right word, but it's basically this set up where, you know, it is, um, for the tourists, it is showing um, the artwork, but but in an outside uh, format. Yeah, <laughs> good answer from, from Gene Carris, the one he did, the one that we think that he did. So the portrait, the, the painting in front of Dr. Gachet's house, is the, isn't the one that I think is the genuine one. It's the, the one that I think, as Jean said so well, the fake, the one that the doctor did. I wonder who decided that. I wonder who made that decision. The, the interesting thing, and just about the portrait of Dr. Gachet is its history. Where is that genuine painting right now? Nobody knows. It's like a, it's an unsolved mystery within an unsolved mystery. And that BuzzFeed video I put up right at the beginning um, they describe the death of Vincent van Gogh. This is These are just guys who do their thing as an unsolved mystery, and kind of is. Um, the, the version we've been given doesn't really make sense. So there's a mystery regarding how Vincent van Gogh died. And it's one of those frustrating mysteries because you can go very far along a certain tangent and then you kind of reach a dead end. Then you say, okay, it's not that. Then you go very far along another tangent and it seems to run out. And that's why it's it's a mystery. We seem to be missing some information. There's contradiction. The problem is we don't seem to understand who this guy was, what he was thinking, what was really going on. And that's what I've tried to do is bring that true crime analysis that that you know precision surgery 
to bear on this particular case, which I felt it really does need. So, yeah, so both in this book by Martin Bailey and in front of Dr. Gachet's house, you've got that second version. Uh, in Wikipedia, it's called the second version. Why wouldn't you be using the first version? You know, the first version is normally the best version. It's like sequels to a movie. You would, you know, you talk about The Matrix, well, the first movie was the classic. Why would you then talk all about the second version, the, the, the what do they call it, the... Um, the follow-up, I, I, I must be. I must have. I must be still sleepy because I can't. I can't think of words now. What are they normally? What's the word they normally use to talk about the second one? The. What's that word? The sequel. That's the word. Yeah, you know, you, that's like just the best word for what it is, and any any other word just is a clumsy version of that. So why on earth are they using the sequel painting? rather than the original painting. Nobody does that. You know what I mean? Um, it's like it's like talking about The Hobbit, but you say, no, we're not going to talk about The Hobbit. Let's talk about The Hobbit and the Five Armies, which is the, the, last, the last movie Peter Jackson made. You know, it's, that's at the end of the line. You know what I mean? It's that, I'm just saying, is that reasonable and does it make sense? So... I would like to know who decided to put that there, you know, who, you know, because I would imagine that Dr. Gachet's home formerly, you know, belonged to Dr. Gachet. So when you be allowed to become a tourist attraction, you probably got to, you know, you probably say, you know, we need this and don't touch that and that's off limits and that and that and that. Um, you know, who decides what the marketing materials are? And what is all the intrigue behind that, right? So anyway, uh, as I say, if there are two portraits of Dr. Gachet, why was this one chosen to signpost the doctor's life and legacy? Why is that one outside his home? Just keep that thought in your back pocket. Now, now we move to page 31 of Bailey's book, and the first text I've highlighted is his admission that, quote, Dr. Gachet was clearly a most unusual character. So even, so it feels a little bit like Bailey's being a bit too positive, right? He's putting a bit too much of a polish and a varnish. But even he admits Dr. Gachet was clearly a most unusual character. He doesn't say, you know what, Dr. Gachet was a bit unusual. He says he was clearly unusual. And so the question is how? How was he unusual? Two or three lines later, he cites Van Gogh writing with emphasis. So you don't get this in the Wikipedia version. In Van Gogh's own letter, so if you get the original letter <laughs> and you look at Van Gogh's original letter to his brother Theo, he doesn't just say, we must not count on Dr. Gachet, right? This is a really important point to stress. When Vincent van Gogh writes his brother in his own handwriting, he doesn't just say, brother, in, in South Africa we'd say, but, but we shouldn't just, we shouldn't count on this guy. He says, we must in no way, and he, and he emphasizes in no way in all caps, right? In the original letter, he emphasizes it in all caps, we must in no way count on Dr. Gachet. Now, I'm, I'm saying to you that I think that Dr. Gachet murdered Vincent van Gogh. And you might say, dude, you are you're dreaming, right? Vincent van Gogh himself, in his own words, is telling you, don't trust this guy. Not, not, it's not like a chance remark somewhere. He emphasizes it right? To his own brother. I mean, can you think of someone that is more important and more trusted that he could have emphasized this to, that he could have been more honest towards? So he says, um, he goes on to describe, so he doesn't just say we mustn't trust him, he goes on. He says, uh, he describes 
Dr. Gesher, unflatteringly as a blind man leading another into a ditch, almost like he's saying, this guy is leading me into a ditch. And if you take the that literally, it's almost like someone who is going to lead to the harm of another person, is going to lead to the undoing of another person, right? And then kind of ominously, he says, not just that it's a blind man leading another into a ditch, he adds, he's iller than I. So, you know, just take that knowledge we have, hindsight, whatever, of Vincent van Gogh, that maybe, let's say you do believe he was suicidal. Let's say you do believe that he was mentally ill. Well, Vincent's saying, this guy's sicker than me. On that scale, that's telling you something. Vincent van Gogh's just come from an asylum. He's saying, this guy's sicker than I am. This doctor is a sicker person than I am. Um, and I don't think he's just saying, you know, he's got syphilis or he is, he's is he got a cold. I think he's talking about mentally is a, like a bad apple, you know, that he's a creep, that he's... There's something wrong with this guy's attitude, right? Because you don't say he's sicker than me, meaning like he's, you know, he's got, uh, um, you know, some kind of disease if you're talking about someone leading another into a ditch. Do you get what I'm saying? And so I just want to bring you back to these words and then Bailey saying that Van Gogh said that, you know, he's like a brother to me. He's like, um, you know, he's this wonderful guy. It's a very big difference between the two. You know, he says, um, I found a ready-made friend that's something like a new brother. Well, this, this is not him saying that. And so what I'm trying to show you is that you can have an art expert, an art historian that knows Van Gogh, that knows the details, that, that knows the diary entries, that knows, the, sorry, the letters, that knows the details, but who is nevertheless subjectively picking and choosing to fit into his narrative. And so um, I put it to you, and this is something often a lawyer will say, I put it to you that two months after writing these words, you know, that we should not count on him, he's iller than I am, um, that that we must not count on Dr. Gachet either, right? So in other words, I'm saying we are warned right here by Van Gogh, don't count on this guy. And I'm saying to you, as we go through this narrative, 70 days later, we shouldn't expect to count on him when Van Gogh really needs his help. If, 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 um, if I'm right... If it's true that Dr. Gachet murdered Van Gogh, then how could you count on him? He's just murdered Van Gogh. Why, why would he come to his aid as a doctor? Does that make sense? You wouldn't expect him to be someone you could count on as a doctor if he just committed, if he just shot him. Would he really want to help him then? Would he really want to, you know, do you get what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is, I'm kind of predicting the future, is saying, Vincent says don't count on him. So I'm saying 70 days later, we shouldn't count on him either. And the question is, what, what, what happened? What happened on that day when Van Gogh died? What did, where was Dr. Gachet? What did Dr. Gachet do that day? Remember, Vincent Van Gogh is shot. He lives another around about 30 hours. That's a plenty of time for the doctor to help him, save him, tend to him, reassure him, support him, um, come to his aid. You know, in an emergency, do what is critically required. And we've just seen in the Baldwin case all the efforts that were made to try and save Helena, right, by people that didn't know her. Well, this doctor knew Vincent Van Gogh. What efforts did he take? Did he call for a helicopter? Okay, there wasn't a helicopter. Did he try and get a train to get her to hospital like they tried to get Helena to hospital? Did he try and stop the bleeding? What did he do, right? And so what I'm trying to say is we're right here. We've just met Dr. Gachet. 
And Vincent says we shouldn't count on him. And I'm saying he's right. We shouldn't count on him. And are we going to see that happen? Are we going to see that he can be counted on or not? What do you think? We are going to answer that question. I'm not just putting the question out there and we're not going to answer it. We're going to deal with what, what kind of quality treatment did Dr. Gachet give Vincent when he was critically injured? What did he do of importance to Vincent when he was injured, when he was dying? What did he do? As a doctor, what, what um, treatment did he offer in this emergency situation? We're going to answer that question. There were witnesses there. There was Adeline Ravu. There was the innkeeper. Um, there was what Vincent told his own brother and also what his own brother saw. Weirdly enough, Theo isn't the greatest witness in what happened to his brother, and I think there's a reason for that as well. For the same reason that I don't think Theo is the greatest witness for Vincent cutting off his ear. I don't think he talks about it very much. Um, why do you think that is? I think it's for the same reason why you don't hear about syphilis, because it's scandalous. This is not a good reflection on a person. So... Um, the bottom line is, you know, Dr. Gachet um, had to come to Van Gogh's aid because he was his doctor when Van Gogh was, was shot. You know, he was the most important person because it was his personal doctor, right? And you might say Dr. Gachet didn't think of it that way. But when Vincent died, Dr. Gachet took several of his artworks as payment, so he definitely did think of himself as Vincent's doctor. Um, now, more than 130 years later, with more than 13 decades worth of hindsight, I'm saying to you, we must not expect Dr. Gachet to come to Van Gogh's aid, just like he said. We must not expect him to come to this artist, <clears throat> A, the way that a military doctor and a forensic specialist, because that's what he is, we'll get to that, um, should have. He, he could have come to his aid as a military doctor. Bear in mind, what do military doctors do in the field? They treat emergencies. They treat them quickly and efficiently. Well, this, was exa this, this felt exactly like that. This guy wounded, and they say he was wounded in a field, so what, why, why can't you treat him in the same way? Like someone wounded in the field of battle. You know, you can think of the military doctors as depicted in Saving Private Ryan on, on the beach, how quickly they are trying to work and how um, urgently all of that's going on. You know, they treat one person quickly, then they treat another one. They're trying to save lives. Was that sort of thing happening with Vincent? What do you think? So... Um, I'm merely putting this out there for you guys to, to almost um, soak up this information to maybe stir your imagination so that by the time we get there, you will have, um, it will, will have brewed in your mind for a while, okay? It's not gonna, so it's not a complete surprise when we deal with it. Um, I just want to refresh my screen here just to see if there are any more comments. Uh, Axie says he didn't do anything. He talked to him. Um, Axie says he he just let him lay there and, and died. Um, Karina and Madoff with his art supplies as well. And that is exactly how he portrayed him, creepy, ill and shifty. Okay, so... You know, I'm not going to comment on what you're saying there, but, you know, um, you guys obviously know a little bit about this case. So um, I think just in general, right in the beginning, it's fair to say that Van Gogh doesn't simply express his reservations about Dr. Gachet. He expresses his reservations emphatically, right? He doesn't just say, you know what, I'm a little bit concerned about this guy. He's emphatic. He's decisive. He's pretty sure of what he's saying. And so when an emergency happens and Van Gogh is literally facing imminent death, 
Are those reservations borne out? You know, when he requires urgent medical care, is the doctor available? Is he forthcoming? Is he doing his job? What do you think? And so, um, as I said, I'm coming here from a true crime perspective and I'm challenging this notion of Dr. Geshe as this cordial, innocent, perfect guy. I'm saying uh, I, I'm not sure if that's true. And someone, some of you were saying, well, it feels like there's a motive coming out. It's not just a motive in terms of possibly protecting his daughter. There's also the aftermath to that motive of this amateur artist who wants to become famous and who wants to do whatever. Well, look how famous Van Gogh became ultimately. And how did that happen? Some people say it was Joe Van Gogh and publishing the letters. That was certainly part of it. But Dr. Gachet had money and influence and he knew the art world. I mean, that is how Theo met him as an, kind of an art dealer meeting a sort of a doyen of the art world, right? A, a, a wealthy guy, a, guy, a wealthy patron who would buy art and entertain artists and hang out with artists. So um, two-thirds of the way through page 31 of Bailey's book, I've highlighted the following. This is quoting from Bailey's book. Quote, although Dr. Gachet may have ended up becoming a skilled artist, so even he is saying, you know, looks like the doctor may have become a skilled artist after all. And, uh, and let's, let's speculate and say Dr. Gachet did end up painting the portrait of Dr. Gachet, painting his own portrait, like a vanity project, right? Um, there's, there, there is some skill there. He must have become a better artist to do that if he did it. So even Bailey is sort of admitting that that's a possibility, that Dr. Gachet, after Vincent van Gogh died, may have gone on to develop some skill as an artist. What did he do with that skill? Um, he says, it is more difficult to envisage Van Gogh taking up medicine. The Sunday, 25 May, was the 15th anniversary of the death of the doctor's wife. Bailey doesn't actually identify her by name. Um, her name's Blanche. I think her surname, I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't know if it's Caste, but it's C I think it's C-A-S-T-E-T-S. -T -E -T but, um, you know, that's the other thing that's quite weird is... You've got a doctor, you've got the daughter, you've got the son, but the, the mother's just gone. The mother's just out of the picture. So what happened to her? And so Bailey, as far as I can see, doesn't actually mention um, uh, mention Dr. Gachet's wife. Just doesn't mention, he doesn't mention her name. Um, that's another mystery that surrounds all of this is that she try and find a photo of Dr. Gachet's wife. You've got a photo of, you've got, um, I think, photos and paintings of his daughter, um, photos and paintings of Dr. Gachet. Um, we know so much about the innkeeper. We know this and that. We, we know about Rene Secretan, but we know almost nothing about Dr. Gachet's wife. What's going on there? And so let's be clear, Dr. Gachet's wife is dead. What happened to her? Why don't we know, why don't we have more clarity about what happened to her? And this is definitely an element where I, where I appreciated Bailey's insight and research. He says, you know, it feels like Vincent arrived at, at the doorstep of, of Dr. Gachet kind of on, on the anniversary of his wife's death. So Dr. Gachet is a widower and she died on May 25th. And I think Vincent arrived in the north of France, in sort of in Paris, in, in Auvers, around about the 18th. So, so on, the, on the, about a week after that was the 15-year anniversary of the death of the doctor's wife. And that may explain why Dr. Gachet was kind of in a bad mood. That may explain in 
Bailey's words why he was initially in the somber mood, right? And uh, I'm sure he's right. I'm sure that is why he was in a, in a bad mood. He was, he was kind of blue and dwelling on his wife. Um, I've been there myself at a certain time of the year. Um, you know, it passes by the timeline of my own mother's death and you f I feel it every year. You know, th 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 a lot of things that happen, it tends to get windier, you have hot and cold days as the seasons are changing. It's kind of a moody time of the year, and, and I feel the weight of, of that history on me. I don't know whether other people would necessarily um, pick that up, but it's real. And so 15 years later, Dr. Gachet is, you know, ruminating on the death of his wife. Now, pages 32 and 33 I have some useful photos in them of the doctor, who I have to say is pretty damn ugly. Is <laughs> is not a terribly good-looking guy. I don't know what you guys think. I mean, the portrait of Dr. Gachet, does, do you think he is a good-looking guy? So this is from page 33, but have a look at um, this color. Yeah, well, it's obviously not a photo but this color painting of Dr. Gachet. And you see him over there. I don't know how clear it is, but he's, he's really not a, a handsome, you know, doctor. Um, on page 32, Bailey writes, quote, although it sounds as if the doctor had a specific drug in mind, he appears never to have prescribed anything, and at that time there was little that could be done, sorry, for mental disorders. So um, this is where we come into foxgloves, right? Um, this is another opportunity for Bailey to mention, even in passing, syphilis. So he has a doctor, is, is, he might be prescribing a drug, He's got foxglove in his garden. Um, he's got this portrait of Dr. Gachet and there's foxgloves there. But, of course, he doesn't mention syphilis. And in this chapter dealing with Dr. Gachet, um, my eyes were peeled looking for a reference to digitalis, a flower also known as, as, as foxgloves. When I was in Auvergne-Souas trampling Dr. Gachet's garden, when I was there myself, I actually photographed foxgloves in his garden. I put um, some of those pictures up on, um, on Patreon. So if any of you are members who want to just get some of that aspect, you can join Patreon for a dollar a month. Um, I would love to show those pictures here, but it just makes it too complicated. Um, I suppose I could do it in a video where you don't see me. But um, anyway, it was at this point in compiling the script that there was a local power outage and it raised around 20 minutes worth of research around the foxgloves. And um, I was, as I would normally do in a situation like this, it's happened to me before where you're working and you lose your work, you just try immediately to get it all back. You know, you, you've sort of got some of it, the residue in your mind, you're just trying to get it all back. Um, I, I just decided not to do that. I, I think I did sort of rewrite about half of what I'd written, but I'd, I thought I'd written quite a nice little narrative and um, I just didn't have it in me to, to get all of it back. So I did get some of it back. I, I did deal with this in detail in The Murder of Vincent Van Gogh, my book, um, but what I want to just emphasize here is in both the genuine or the first version of the portrait of Dr. Gesher and the second, what do you see in both paintings? Foxgloves, right? So Vincent van Gogh or Dr. Gesher, or whoever painted those paintings, felt that the foxgloves was important enough to depict. They're in the garden and they are kind of right beside the doctor's hands, almost as if to say, I'm going to now turn this into medicine, right? Um, so I think that Van Gogh clearly felt it was important to link this particular flower to the doctor in terms of his identity. You know, 
you know, Van Gogh may have been thinking of the doctor as a dude with a garden, as a doctor with a garden, as a doctor with flowers. But it's also possible that the doctor favoured digitalis as a cure-all, as something that he often prescribed. And if he was doing that, he was actually poisoning his patients. And if he was doing that, and perhaps if his wife was sick, did he poison her? I'm not saying purposefully, but did his treatment of her actually not do any good? Um, so, so where we're kind of getting at now is that the doctor is inadvertently harming his patients. Um, and how much of a stretch is that to purposefully harming someone, especially if you're a military doctor, right? Um, food for thought. So the other thing is if Van Gogh thought the foxglove was worth depicting, why doesn't Bailey do that? I'm not sure if he does depict it in the next chapter. I just didn't see any reference to foxgloves or digitalis in his index. Maybe I missed it. But in the previous video, I made the point that Bailey seems to be tiptoeing around the nasty cesspit of syphilis and how it may be and probably is very relevant to the story. If that's true, then his sidestepping of the foxgloves aspect also makes sense. Why? Because in 1890s France, foxglove was a classic treatment for syphilis. Now, I say that under correction, that's my understanding. Um, in that time, you know, the medical field was pretty primitive. They didn't always get things right. And um, my understanding from the research that I've done was that, for example, in the asylum, um, one of the ways they would have treated what they thought was epilepsy, so they may have thought, you know, Van Gogh is seeing visions and is being mentally unstable and he's having seizures, well, he, he has epilepsy, right? And then they would treat... Now, if you think about it in a very basic way, if you prescribe a... Let's say you purposefully prescribe a, a small amount of poison, it's going to have the same effect as a sedative. So in other words, not enough poison to kill someone, but enough poison to make someone calm down. Not, not in a good way because you're ill, but it's certainly going to calm you down because you're being poisoned, right? Um, but this is where it gets quite interesting. The symptoms of advanced syphilis and the symptoms for epilepsy are very similar. Advanced syphilis is neurosyphilis equals seizures, epilepsy equals seizures. So how would you treat epilepsy digitalis? And is that what the doctor thought that Vincent van Gogh was suffering from? Epilepsy? Or, or did he know that it was syphilis? That's quite an interesting question. That's definitely quite an interesting question. I would think being, being a military doctor and him seeing what the soldiers were doing and suffering from, that he, and bear in mind this doctor actually won awards, that he would um, know syphilis for what it was. I could be wrong though, you know, you could say that in that time the medical knowledge was really poor, it's also a possibility. But the other possibility is that this doctor had experienced syphilis and he recognized it in Vince van Gogh and that made him Initially, he was pretty open, but later on he was pretty worried about a syphilitic fellow hanging around his daughter. Um, <clears throat> so you're not going to find too many classic treatments for syphilis using digitalis, but you are going to find a lot of classic treatments for epilepsy using digitalis, uh, um, you know, th that's that's not difficult to find. Um, if you go to the Wikipedia 
I like using Wikipedia because it's just this generic thing. It's like it's, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is just well known. So if you go to the Wikipedia description of digitalis, they say it was once used very, very commonly, as you can see in those portraits of Dr. Gachet. It was used to regulate the pulse. I think it was someone here talked about the heartbeat or something. Um, it was used also for the treatment of epilepsy. Um, let's look at some of your comments here. So my own grandfather, so um, my grandmother was the daughter of this famous artist, but my grandfather's, um, he, he actually died of, of a, of, being prescribed a drug in uh, that, that, that amounted to an overdose. So at that time, I think it was cortisol. At that time, cortisol was used for pain, but they didn't know how much was the right amount. And so he was given cortisol and he took it to, to a degree that was toxic. I'm not saying that he was addicted to cortisol, but he took a dose of it uh, when he was suffering, I think, from arthritis. And so he's prescribed this dose of something that is actually medicine, is actually pain relieving, but, but they didn't know what is the right amount. And so he took what he was prescribed and he died as a result of that. I think that's the same thing that happened to Oscar Pistorius's mother. She was prescribed something and, you know. So... Um, you, you often have that with doctors a long time ago. Um, so I don't really want to go much further down this particular rabbit hole. We're already over two hours, but um, I've dealt with it in detail in my book. Um, but the generic history of epilepsy from Wikipedia also spells out the association between epilepsy and syphilis quite well. Um, my understanding in France was that if you had all sorts of problems, you know, a disease, depression, um, you know, all sorts of mental illness, all of it went under the same umbrella of epilepsy. So it wasn't epilepsy, but epilepsy was a sort of umbrella term for a lot of ailments that they ha hadn't yet differentiated, right? Bear in mind how long it took for terms like ADD and ADHD to come out. You know, medicine has been able to fine tune its definitions of certain disorders where a long time ago you just felt out of sorts. There was no real label for it. I think that's been helpful in certain ways and, and not helpful in others. You might label yourself something when you are just out of sorts. But sometimes you do need a label for something that is really happening in order to treat it properly. And so you can imagine the difference between the syphilis label and the epilepsy label, a world of difference in treatments, right? Um, so in general, you know, if we take our place in history where we are now and we say, okay, um, if Van Gogh was in the asylum and he was being treated with foxglove and he was slowly being poisoned, you know, without knowing it, you know, unintentionally, then his best chance of recovery was to get out of the asylum, was to do precisely what he did do, which is get out, get some fresh air and exercise, get this stuff out of his system. And so he ends up at Dr. Gachet's garden and there's the foxglove waiting for him. Um... That's the other thing just to, to mention is that, you know, he leaves the asylums, something I mentioned in the previous episode, he leaves the asylum to come alive, and he does. And possibly part of that rebirth was him no longer being treated with poisonous um, medicine, right? So why would he commit suicide if he's feeling better, if he's coming alive? You know, why would you come alive and commit suicide? So, as I say, it makes sense in the opposite direction. If he's come alive 
and everything that's going on there. And then he goes to the asylum and they, they poison him. And, you know, I, I have a feeling that he must have felt, wow, since I've been in this asylum, I've just felt weak and the shadow of death coming over me. And I've just felt not myself. I need to get out. And, and, and that intuition, I think, was, was sound, I, I, I believe. Uh, let's look at his name was Frodo. Okay. Corina says digital is still used today, alas, synthetic. Oh, shame. Sorry to hear that, Axie. Sorry to hear about your dog. Oh, is, is the dog's name was Frodo. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, excellent point from Jean Carras. Doctors back then knew better how to treat gunshot wounds than mental health. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, in terms of the last three pages, Bailey's second chapter on Dr. Gesha, I've, I've highlighted the following. Number one, Dr. Gesha's home in Orvez was formerly a girls' school. This could be irrelevant, but it's also possible um, that some of the girls who went to that school still popped around. Um, remember in those days, it was kind of more of a villagey atmosphere. And so, um, you know, they may have known the, um, you know, the people cleaning the home, you know, the servants. The servants that cleaned the school may have stayed on to clean the home. Um, the Gachets did have a housekeeper. Um, you may also have a, had a gardener who was there for the school or whatever, but I'm just saying you might have had some um, sort of overlap between the people from the school and the people from the, the, the um, Dr. Gachet. Bear also in mind that people would need to go to his house anyway for treatment, I would assume. So I would assume that Dr. Geshe occasionally treated people, um, you know, like that would come to him for treatment, just like Vincent van Gogh did. Um, and perhaps some of them were these schoolgirls, you know, that had gone to the school. Um, maybe they're no longer at school, but who would, um, they're familiar with that particular building and with that road and with that place kind of thing. Um, and I suppose it's a possibility that Marguerite may have had an unusual share, may have had an unusual share of female visitors as a result, even if it was just one or two village girls popping around there. Oh, you know what? Um, you know, in passing, oh, you know what? Uh, in the house you're staying in, I used to go to school there. Oh, that's interesting. What's your name? Oh, blah, 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 right? Something like that. Um, I know my home where I grew up was opposite an all girls school. And I think it's fair to say that the front and back garden was occasionally crawling with schoolgirls for reasons I'm not going to go into. But, um, you know, just in a scenario of our house was near an all girls school. And there were times where there were a lot of girls in the house, in the garden, um, you know, co coming and going. And I don't know if that would have been the case if our home was not located near a school. Um, so so I think that that's just something to consider. I don't think it's, it's of a lot of merit, but I think it's something that's worth considering. The second point is when Van Gogh arrived at Dr. Gachet's home, he found the doctor in the company of two youngsters, 16-year-old, Paul, that's Dr. Gachet's son, and 22-year-old, sorry, 20-year-old Marguerite, the doctor's daughter. And these must have been like, it must have been like the fresh faces of youth and, and a breath of fresh air compared to the creaking lunacy of the asylum. You know, the, you know, we're in the asylum, it's people who are dying, who are losing their minds, who are losing the vitality, and, and here are two youngsters who are um, just starting their lives. And um, I've got a really good friend who's got three young, well, I wouldn't say boys, um, They, the, I think the boy, the one kid is 17 or 18 years old, 
the others are early 20s. And so whenever I visit him, they're often there and you see their girlfriends and you, you, you kind of get a very youthful sense of what's going on. You know, they're playing computer games, um, they, they've just come back from sport or whatever. And so that brings a sort of atmosphere of, of sort of fun and youth and whatever and lightness, which is totally different than when you're with much older people. And so I wonder whether that didn't um, um, have an impact on Van Gogh's state of mind. You know, these young people, their optimism, their spirit, you know what I mean? And so that may also have been something that made made the Dr. Gachet experience more fun and more interesting, right? That that aspect. Bear in mind, Vincent didn't have his own children. Um, didn't have, um, you know, and so in a, in a way he, he was sort of becoming part of the Gachet family, not, not just becoming kind of a friend of Dr. Gachet, but kind of becoming a friend with his kids and them with him and certainly with Marguerite painting her and obviously adding the, the odd chat here and then if you're a very very lonely artist um, that probably does had to have meant something to Van Gogh wouldn't you say Axie says great point like the young shoots just appearing in the field in the painting behind you, yeah. Okay, so the third point, Dr. Gesh, and this is where it gets really, really interesting. So you might say, mm, yeah, I don't know whether any of this adds up to murder. You know, that's really dark. <clears throat> I, I think that's a bit of a, I think that's a bit of a giant leap. But this is where, where we get into some of that darkness. Number three, Dr. Gachet had a collection of human bones at the back of his house. So in effect, the rear of the house, the rear of this house of Dr. Gachet backs into kind of a cliff. Now bear in mind, if you imagine this is the, the ridge, right? It's running like this. So my arm is like the ridge. And, <clears throat> and the river Aus is is over here, <clears throat> then any houses that are between the river and the hillside are sort of on the hillside. And so any house on the hillside backs into the hillside, right? And so Dr. Gachet's house is one of those houses. And so <clears throat> the area where Dr. Gachet's house backed into a hillside was actually an ancient cemetery. So you literally had a scenario where you might have a shower of rain or a storm or, um, you know, dry season or something, and some bones, human bones, would sort of roll into the garden from the hillside behind, right, which, which as I said, was a former cemetery. And so... Um, by the way, Bailey actually literally talks about this. He talks about the likelihood of human bones literally rolling into Dr. Gachet's garden, right? And so I actually feel the need to restate this for emphasis. The back of Dr. Gachet's house was a graveyard. Now think about that aspect of, you know, Vincent van Gogh leaves the asylum, leaves this shadow of death, this dark, dingy place, and he goes to Auvers, and Auvers is a great spot. It's a garden, and it's sunny, and it's just lovely. But Dr. Gachet's house is sort of a mixed bag. There's, there's this lovely garden, and there's these um, spirited young people, and everything is pretty cool. But there's an aspect to it that's, that's, that, that's kind of troubling, the human bones, the graveyard, the fact that the doctor would actually take some of these skulls into his home and so there were skulls in his home. The, the, the fact that there was this morbid fascination with death, the fact that his own wife had died as well, right? So so although there's this aspect to Auvers that's like a fairy tale, mm. 
that's magical, that's that's pretty. There's another aspect to it that's that's dark and morbid, right? As Karina says, uh, life and death in one place. Well, we've got a we've got a new member. That's great to see. Welcome, Robin. Welcome. Um, a very dark side. Yeah. So, I also took photos of the back garden and the back of the house of Dr. Gesho, where it goes into the cliff and uh, it kind of feels like um, they used some of the eroded cliff which is kind of like a cave and then they they sort of turned it into a building so so there's a, there's a certain degree of the cave slash cemetery being used as a garden shed or a kind of um, how can I put it? Um, perhaps even a stable. So, so you might use that back part of the garden where the cliff is sort of crumbling and then you put walls there and you can actually make other rooms and, and buildings going into the cliff. So although there are bones and stuff there, you can kind of use those spaces for other things such as store your gardening equipment, um, store your garden chairs and tables and stuff. And you might have some animals. You might want to, you know, if you've got uh, certain animals, you can, they can stay there. You know, you might have a, a pony or a donkey or a whatever. And, um, you know, they can kind of stay over there. So, that, so it just adds another dimension to the uh, gachet property, Right. Now, let me just ask you like a very simple question. Do, do you, th yeah, Grotto, do you think the title of this episode referring to the doctor as creepy is unfair? Do you think I've been uh, um, like trying to sensationalize this episode by calling the doctor creepy? Um, well, skulls sometimes featured in Dr. Gachet's art. Right? So, quoting from page 36, Bailey writes in his book, the, that very skull survives and is now on display in his house. So, if, I, if memory serves right now, if you go to Dr. Gachet's house right now, you'll find a skull in his house. So, this is not like conspiracy theory. It's not um, some kind of old wives' tale. Um, it's a fact that, that you have these bo human bones that are part of this doctor's, the, the um, what do you call it, the decor of his home. And here, is, here it is in, in the book. There, there, you can see the skull there, and there's referred to again. And so it's, this is not thumb-sucking. And, you know, if you want to blame Bailey for... Um, how can I put it? If, if you want to accuse Bailey of putting uh, two, um, almost like a chocolate box veneer on the Van Gogh story, well, even he is acknowledging that Dr. Gachet was a bit of a odd dude, you know, with the skulls and all that kind of thing. So, so you know, it definitely is established fact. It's, it's not um, hocus pocus. It's not urban legend. It's a fact. And so somebody who is a military doctor and who's got bones and stuff lying around him, what do you think his attitude, and his wife has died, what do you think his attitude is towards death in general? Do, do you think death is this abstract concept or, or is it something that is that is quite familiar with? <clears throat> so a few of you have said that creepy is spot on. Thanks for that. So as I say, Bailey acknowledges Dr. Gachet's interest in morbid subject matter by referencing a painting where Dr. Gachet actually poses with a skull. So 
you know, isn't it enough already? You know, is, is this military doctor, uh, he, he's, he's got skulls and bones in his home, human skulls and bones, and he even poses with a skull um, while dressed as St. Francis of Assisi. Let me see if I can find that, that painting. Um, yeah, there it is. So I don't know if you can see this guy posing with a skull. Can you see that? So, yeah, it is definitely pretty creepy. And so when Van Gogh says, well, this guy is sicker than I am, what do you really think he's talking about? Do you think he's physically sick? I think anybody seeing a lot of bones lying around is going to think, jeepers, what the hell is going on here? What kind of doctor are we dealing with? Is this Dr. Mengele? Is this um, Frankenstein's doctor? What is going on? You know, I've come here to be healed, not to be sort of, you know, have my bones played with one day kind of thing. Um, right next to me is, is Ivy. Um, shall I show it to you? Ivy. Hello. I think she wants some food. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up. Um, I think I'm at, well, two and, almost two and a half hours. I'm surprised my voice has lasted this long. Um, uh, where was I? So Bailey writes about how some of these impressions of the doctor might have informed Vincent's initial negative opinion of him, you think? And the, the weird thing is that he doesn't have, he doesn't seem to have a negative opinion of um, Dr. Gachet. Like, that's why he uses that, that, that quote that from, 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 um, from Vincent himself, that, that endorsement. It's kind of a weird quote, I think. Anyway, um, Bailey then concludes his chapter by explaining how invigorating and pleasurable it must have been to paint in the doctor's garden. Once again, I don't know if Bailey realized this, but he's symbolically explaining Van Gogh's development since his departure in the asylum to the garden of Auvers and in general. He's kind of saying, you know what, Van Gogh uh, uh, is happy. Van Gogh's enjoying himself. Van Gogh is being invigorated. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's going well. So why, why is he committing suicide? And again, this is from Bailey's own version of events. Bailey's saying that Van Gogh is having good time. He's, he's happy to be where he is. And it's not Bailey speculating. It's Bailey using Van Gogh's own words. It's Bailey repeating Van Gogh's own words in his letters to his brothers saying, I like it here. I'm enjoying myself. It's good. So why, why would he commit suicide? So I'm going to be repeating this a couple of times. All the times that Bailey refers to Vincent being happy and each time saying, okay, but if you're so happy, why do you want to commit suicide? Surely at some point when you're not happy, you're going to say that. If you're going to commit suicide because you're unhappy, well, aren't you going to say you're unhappy about something somewhere? Aren't you going to say, well, you know what? I'm really not enjoying that. You know, my room is really hot. It's a small room. I'm really not enjoying it. I'm really not enjoying not getting money on time from you or you're not giving me enough money. Or, um, you know, Dr. Gachet is driving me nuts. He's really making me depressed. Or, you know what, I've got a crush on this woman who's much too young for me and, and I just know that she's worried about my ear and, and she's never going to get over it. And it's just so... You know what I mean? So I'm just saying that he doesn't do that. He doesn't say that he's struggling. He doesn't say that. I'm just saying there are many references to him being happy and there aren't really references to him being unhappy, right? And I know that that's simplistic, but it's nevertheless um, basically true, isn't it? Um, Madeline, hello Nick, sorry for my late entrance, but I was enjoying listening to you. Great to, 
Great to have you here. Vincent had a new lease on life. Yes. So at the bottom of page 36, and this is concluding his chapter, and I'm about to wrap up as well. We're almost at two and a half hours. Um, but at the bottom of page 36, concluding his chapter, Bailey writes, quote, um, working in the doctor's garden gave Vincent great pleasure. Not a little bit of pleasure, not like, mm, no, it's okay. He really enjoyed it, right? I've also been in that garden. It's got a lovely view over <clears> Orvez. <throat> it's pleasant. Um, and so why would he be suicidal if he's working in such pleasurable surroundings? Bailey concludes, completely concludes, writing that Vincent remained worried about Dr. Gachet's mental condition, adding that it was probably quite unnecessary, really. These are... Um, Bailey's opinions of Vincent. So he's saying, you know what, Vincent was probably was still a little bit concerned about this doctor. Vincent was probably, you know, probably had reason to be a bit iffy. But you know what, uh, it was probably completely unnecessary. Well, I'm saying I think it was necessary. I, I'm saying it probably was necessary not just for Vincent van Gogh to be wary of Dr. Gachet, of this oddball doctor, but I think the doctor was totally justified in being wary of Vincent van Gogh. If you know about Vincent van Gogh's um, womanizing and boozing and his backstory, then the father of this young girl had every reason to be wary. Does that make sense? I'm not certainly not pointing the finger at Dr. Gachet saying he's the only villain in the story or that, that he's the bad guy and Vincent van Gogh's the good guy. I'm saying that they both had reason to be a little bit careful of one another. And so um, the interesting thing, thanks a lot, Stephanie. Thanks a lot for that. The interesting thing is the way Bailey ends his chapter on Dr. Gachet. So he's dedicated this chapter to Dr. Gachet, to introducing us to him. And he ends it off um, in a way that is very different to the effusiveness, the, affir uh, the affirmative um, complimentary quote about Vincent's attitude towards the doctor and his chapter title. It's very different a very different vibe um, the beginning that uh, that you get in the ending and the ending quotes Van Gogh's letter to Theo and this is what he says and he's obviously referring to Dr. Gachet he says he certainly appears to me as ill and confused as you or I and he's older and a few years ago he lost his wife but he's very much a doctor and his, and his profession and his faith keep him going. And I, I do think that the reference to profession and faith is almost saying that this guy is struggling, but, but his work is keeping him going. This guy is struggling, but his faith in God is keeping him going. This guy is you know, maybe struggling with depression or anxiety or just the meaninglessness of life or whatever it is, but his work is keeping him going, right? And I, I think that that's a bit of an analogy for Van Gogh himself. I think um, his work is keeping him going. His faith in his work is also keeping him, him going. Um, his... Yeah, his, his um, vision for, for what he wants to do, Van Gogh now, is keeping him going. It's the opposite of someone who's suicidal. Van Gogh has got a reason to live just like this disturbed doctor has got a reason to live. And I think this doctor ended up living to the, the ripe old age of 80, which is pretty old for eight, uh, 1890. You know, to live that age is pretty amazing. I mean, he lived more than twice as long as Vincent van Gogh. So he must have been doing something right. 
Um, so to wrap up, um, this isn't going to take very long. I just want to provide you with some facts that go beyond Bailey's narrative, right? So these are, this is the narrative that I think is important and that I've sort of come up with. Not I've come up with, but that I've put together that I think is relevant and important. Are you ready? So I just want to stress, this is the narrative I think is important that Bailey, I think, has left out. And I'll leave it to you to decide whether that's true or not. Is it important? Is it relevant? Yes or no? Bear in mind, it is a bit of a contest to say, this is my attitude to the reasonableness of making almost like a legal case for the murder of Dr. Gachet, Ugh, the, the murder of... Um, uh, in a way, I guess I am murdering Dr. Gachet's reputation by accusing him of this. But what I'm trying to also ask you is it's a contest between this very credible art historian and the true crime analysis I'm doing and saying which one really holds up to scrutiny. It's up to you to decide. And each time we do an episode, I'm really going to call on you to say, well, which do, do you see my argument and does it make sense? Does it make more sense? So Dr. Gachet was a military doctor. Some sources describe him as a railway doctor. I'm not quite sure what that means. He served on the front lines during the, Prus the Prussian siege of Paris in 1870, so 20 years before Van Gogh arrived there. And so he also had access to firearms. He had access to firearms in his earlier life. He was exposed to them and he had access to firearms. He kept firearms uh, at the time that Vincent van Gogh pitched up. Dr. Gachet was also a forensic doctor. You, again, you might say, wow, true crime is absolutely irrelevant. Sorry, absolutely irrelevant to Vincent van Gogh. Well, Dr. Gachet was a forensic doctor, meaning he was qualified to perform autopsies. And so these human bones in his garden, you, you might say, Okay, so there's a cemetery, it's not a big deal. Um, somebody said, well, wouldn't you repatriate those bones? Well, most people would. I think the doctor was more comfortable with his bones being around him because of his background in the military and because he performed autopsies. So he was death wasn't kind of a stranger to him. He was used to um, the... That sort, of, that sort of graphic unraveling of, of a human body. He was sort of used to that idea. And so the other thing is that Gachet was also an aspiring amateur artist. Bailey mentions that, but I don't think he takes it far enough. Um, he wasn't just aspiring in an average way. He wasn't just like, well, you know what, I'd like to be an artist. He was kind of obsessed with the idea. Um, he was obsessed with developing an artistic legacy. He was so obsessed that he, he made sure that when he was buried, he wasn't buried in the same graveyard as the sort of pauper's um, cemetery as, as, as Vince van Gogh. He was buried with all the other artists and luminaries in Paris. So, I mean, you know, he, he died in Auvers, but he was buried in this super-duper cemetery in Paris. I've been there. It's, it's you know, like... The, the, the gravestone is almost like a, a, a city. Each grave has got like a little building, uh, like almost like, like, like a house. Um, and uh, anyway, so that's where Dr. Gachet felt that's, that's the appropriate setting for him because he's no ordinary dude kind of thing. That, that's the high opinion he had of himself. So, you know, he wasn't just aspiring to be an artist. He was interested in this legacy, you know, of that he's really a somebody, you know. And and then you have Vincent van Gogh, who's, who's kind of a nobody, who doesn't really have much of an opinion of himself coming around. Um, and um, anyway, Dr. Gachet painted under the name Paul Van Rysel. So again, you might say, I don't, I don't think there's any point to this thing of, of, you know, why would Dr. Gachet paint his own portrait? You know, I, I doubt whether he could do that even. Well, he actually had a another name for himself 
another identity of himself as an artist. So his name was Paul Gachet, but he also painted under the name Paul Van Rice. And, and obviously, if you've never heard of that name, it's because he never mounted too much as an artist. Um, he also often collected and copied the works of well-known artists um, and not like nobody artists. He, he was, uh, I think he had, um, I don't know whether he entertained or whether he, he owned the artworks of Cezanne, um, um, uh, it wouldn't be Picasso, uh, but quite a few well-known artists, like super-duper well-known artists. Um, uh, we'll probably deal with that in... Um, in another another chapter, I just want to see whether um, yeah. So he talks about Cezanne, Pissarro. I think was another artist that became pretty well known, but he owned quite a few artworks. Um, Anyway, I think you, if you really want to know the, all the art that he kept, just, just go and read up about um, Dr. Gachet on Wikipedia. Um, I think Monet might, he might have owned some Monet's as well. So, um, so he wasn't just a wannabe artist, he was quite an obsessed artist, right? And the cat is trying to get my attention, so it's trying to scratch the cover of this book to do that, which will definitely get my attention. Um, so in the same way that he wasn't just a wannabe artist, he was like a woohoo, I really want to make art kind of guy. He was really obsessed about it. He wasn't just a doctor either. He wasn't just, oh, he's a doctor. But he was a military doctor. Um, he was a forensic doctor guy who performed autopsies. He'd won awards for his being a doctor. He just didn't seem to be much of a doctor towards Vincent van Gogh, but um, he, he also knew all about syphilis, I believe, because of his experience in a war setting, because of his experience with soldiers. Um, it wasn't called the French disease for nothing. It wasn't associated with soldiers for nothing. Um, as, as far as I'm aware, and I could be wrong on this point, I, I, I'm, I was trying to find a source for this, but it's my understanding that his wife, Blanche, had syphilis. I could be wrong on that. Um, I didn't go into the, the deep level of research as I did when I wrote my book, but the, the, it's very difficult finding source material on his wife. Just is very very difficult. Um, uh, she died uh, on May twenty fifth, eighteen seventy five, just seven years after marrying um, Doctor Gachet. Um, I, I hope that date's right, but I, th I think it's yeah, seven years later. Um, and so the question is, what impact? would Van Gogh's condition have had on the doctor had he recognized the symptoms in his wife that he saw in Van Gogh? There's also quite a lot of mystery surrounding uh, Dr. Gachet's wife, as I've said. This isn't really brought up by Bailey. Um, as I say, see if you can find a photo of Dr. Gachet's wife or any information of any kind about her. Um, what we do know is Van Gogh arrived on Dr. Gachet's doorstep in Orvez, as I say, very close to the 15th anniversary of Blanche Gachet's death. We're not done with the doctor or the portraits of Dr. Gachet, but let me ask you a question. Is it just a coincidence that the most valuable and famous portrait Van Gogh ever painted was of Dr. Gachet? Is that just a fluke? Is it a coincidence that a second portrait of the good doctor, so not only the coincidence that the most expensive painting Van Gogh painted is the portrait of Dr. Gachet, but there's also a second portrait of the good doctor um, that emerged and Dr. Gachet happens to have it. And let's not forget the fact that it's Dr. Gachet. It's a portrait of Dr. Gachet. It's not just 
a portrait Dr. Gachet has. It's a portrait of Dr. Gachet that Dr. Gachet has. Do you follow? In true crime, we don't believe in coincidences. So what do you think? What do you think? Is this coincidence or is there something more to it than that? So um, that is my spiel. Uh, I'll leave it to you again to, to ask yourself the question, is there something here? Is there something there? Is there, is there more to the story than meets the eye? And it is very early in the story. We are still, I, I think you'll agree that what we've dealt with with Dr. Gachet definitely takes things to a higher level than the first episode. And as we go on, we're gonna, it's gonna ratchet up a, a gear. Of course, when we deal with the day Vincent van Gogh died, then, it, then we really are gonna be dealing with the true crime aspect head on. That's when we're really gonna say, does this make sense or, or would this be more reasonable? Timmy, come. Timmy, come, come, come away. Time for Timmy's cameo. I think Timmy's been using me for ASMR. So he's been having a good little sleep while hearing his master's comforting tone. Unless he was just as far away from me as he could be, where he couldn't hear me so that he could sleep. That's also possible. Timmy actually needs a, a bath and a shave. I, um, I need neither because I've had both. Um, Karina, thanks a lot for that. Karina says, Nick to Bailey Zero. But, you know, if there's some of you that feel, you know what, you're not making your case, I still think blah, 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 that's fine. Um, but let's see if you can maintain that position throughout. So don't be afraid to say, I disagree with you on that, or why do you say that? That wouldn't make sense. Don't be afraid to say that. If you've got questions, it's fine. True Jedi Forever uh, says, wouldn't it have wouldn't it have to be a conspiracy with Theo? Um, that is an excellent question. I don't really want to deal with it here, but um, I would answer that briefly to say yes. And what I mean by that is, um, let, let me give you an example. If Theo knew that Paul Gogar had attacked and injured his brother, um, so let's say he either knew it or he suspected it or Vincent told him, this is something different, that Paul Gogar had cut off his, his brother's ear, um, would Theo have kind of run back to Paris and said, and or, or even gone to the police and said, um, Paul Gogar cut off my brother's ear. Um, it was him, you know, arrest him. Well, he couldn't very well do that because Theo was an art dealer and part of the art that he was dealing with was Paul Gauguin's art. And they, they kind of had a, a deal going on. Paul, Vincent and Theo had a, had a business arrangement going on. So um, Theo couldn't very well turn on Paul Gogar, if if Paul Gogar had done something because Theo needed his job and Theo Theo had certain interests and part of those interests was selling Paul Gogar's work, which was selling at that time. So do you see how the plot thickens with that? Now you've got Theo, who is an art dealer, and Theo, not just Vincent van Gogh that's pals with Dr. Gachet, it's also Theo. Theo actually introduced the two to each other. Theo's an art dealer. Dr. Gachet is an art buyer. So you're going to want to alienate your, your best client. Are you going to want to alienate a dude that is setting you up with other artists, etc.? Does that make sense? So you might say, well, if Theo knew Dr. Gachet murdered his brother, and you might say, well, he didn't murder him, he was just upset with him and he shot him, or or even Vincent has been this kind of loose cannon all along, he sort of deserved someone putting him in place. Maybe Vincent van Gogh was drunk. Um, 
whatever, um, you know, even if he knew that, is he going to put up his hand and say, Dr. Gachet, and make all these accusations when he's an art dealer and Dr. Gachet is a very respected, very wealthy art, um, you know, a doyen of the art society. It makes sense, right? Uh, PW says, you're making a compelling case. Thanks for that. Stephanie says, excellent points. Axie, oh boy, the blood thickens. And so it's very important. So it's one thing to, to, to have these ideas that make sense, that, that sort of psychologically work. But the question is, do they, do they actually play out in the crime? Do they actually play out in terms of when Vincent van Gogh is injured, what does Dr. Gachet do? Because if you have a situation of that he does shoot Vincent, but then he comes and he tries to help him, it's like, oh, 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 are you injured? What can I do? Oh, let me get, take the bullet out of you. Let's 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 get you fixed up. Th then then that would cast doubt on him committing the crime. In other words, if Dr. Gachet is trying to save Vincent it would make sense that he didn't kill him or shoot him or harm him. But if Dr. Gachet doesn't try, then you can make the case that does Dr. Gachet, is, does he have some reservations about Vincent for some reason, right? So those things have got to line up as well. So I'm trying to develop the narrative first that there are reasons to suspect the doctor. We've also got to look at Vincent's, natural inclination as a man to do whatever he's going to do and the scenario he's walking into every time he goes to Dr. Gachet. And is this going to have an effect? Think about the length of time we're talking about. He goes to Dr. Gachet uh, regularly for two and a half months. Is that enough time for strong feelings to develop, do you think? Um... Karina says, what did Theo die of so shortly after Vincent? Syphilis. Yeah, syphilis. Okay, so I'm I'm not going to take it further than that. It's two hours, 45 minutes, quite a long live. I'm surprised I haven't needed to drink more of my water, but I've got another glass waiting for me, but uh, my voice seems to have held up. I think it also helps to have fewer people in chat because uh, I often get uh, a little bit anxious when, you know, for example, someone will come up with a totally different comment, like about a different case, and that does make it difficult to stay on your, your, um, on your subject matter. So I just want to thank you guys. Thank you for the super chats. Thank you for all the new members. I think there are something like 15 new members, and I know other channels would laugh at that and say, ha, ha, ha. To me, that's a nice manage, manageable amount, it's like a classroom. And um, because of the length of these episodes, you know, it's not for everybody, but um, I do think it is, um, I think it's quite interesting, quite fascinating. So in the next episode, we'll be dealing with more about Orves, the village, the setting. I'll put up a different painting of uh, Vincent. Um, the next the next episode is called Nests in the in the book, and it's the it's a kind of a fond way that Van Gogh described these sort of thatch thatched hamlets in Orvez, you know, that, that looked like just this wonderful place to make a family, almost like birds making a family. He, he, he saw this as human beings making these nests out of um, you know uh, thatched. Uh, thatched homes and, and these, these wonderful little cottages. And again, in this setting, do you really think anyone's going to be suicidal? He's in this pleasant setting, this lovely village. He's going out every day and he's painting these wonderful um, uh, landscapes that, such as that you see behind me. And it's, it's beautiful. It's invigorating. Summer is, um, you know, um, summer is sort of, exploding and blossoming and blooming and there's all this energy 
and Vincent's actually coming alive again. He's, he's feeling happy and things are actually really coming together. And in the previous series I did, you guys can find the playlist. I often use the words of Simon Sharma, where he talks about, you know, and I thought in a very emphatic way, where he talks about everything was coming right for Vincent van Gogh. He just had a good review for his art. He's painting a picture a day. You know, he was really finding himself as an artist. He was, he was getting into the groove and then he commits suicide. And in that introduction, Simon Sharma to me encapsulates the contradiction of the Van Gogh story that a lot of people have missed and I've been wanting to address. So I hope I have. I hope I have and I hope I am. And I hope it's interesting. Robin says, thank you. I'll get your book. Thanks for that, Robin. <clears throat> Stephanie says, love seeing your passion come alive. You mean with Van Gogh or with me? <laughs> um, yeah, in terms of the next episode, probably won't be the same time. It'll probably be earlier. I've had to time this episode the way I have for for two reasons. The one is the um, the load shedding, the power going out. I think it's going out again in about an hour. And then also my sleeping patterns have sort of adjusted a little bit. Um, I was because of trying to cater to the American market with my YouTube videos, I've needed to be awake when it's when the Americans are awake. Even if I'm not trying to do that, I often will get comments and um, there's breaking news happening and I need to react to it. I, I just feel conscientious in that way. But that often takes me out of my sleep cycle. And now I'm sort of coming back into it. And so I would prefer to do this not at four o'clock in the morning, my time, but at about midnight, at about uh, and midnight, my time is about 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, your time. So will that suit you guys? Um, Jean says, I nominate Karina, number one fan. <laughs> I think in terms of the Vincent van Gogh, I think that is true. Karina is very interested. Karina says, thank you to all in our illustrious and exclusive group. Thank you. To, I must say it's really nice having a nice small group who aren't um, arguing with each other and, and people seem to, yeah, seem to know me and certainly my mods are here. Um, I think it's, uh, is it, it, it might be 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, around about then, but I'll let you guys know. Karina says, oh, I already was a wide person while in diapers. Okay, Stephanie, thanks a lot for joining us. I know you had other things going on. Uh, thanks to the other mods as well. Thanks to Jean and to Sharon. Sharon's still here. Um, and um, I hope to see you guys again. Um, maybe we'll have a few more members as well. Uh, PW says, earlier today I watched two of Nick's three 2020 videos of his trips to Al and Saint-Rami, and I would highly recommend them. Now, I must say I put quite a lot of effort into those videos. I think they've been viewed 700 times or something. Uh, at the beginning of this video, I spoke about a Buzz News um, video dealing with the mystery of Van Gogh's death, and they provide both narratives. So if you want to get a concise summary of it, fairly concise, um, then they've done it. Um, that's been viewed like 9 million times. I mean, that was what went up about two years ago. And so I do find it quite frustrating that what I believe is far more factual, what I believe, I believe my research is, is more comprehensive than Bailey's, isn't more credible, that's for you to decide, but nobody really seems to care. But maybe over time that might change, let's hope so. Axie says, you are all so much fun. I hope so. Karina says, that is midnight for me. Perfect. Karina, thanks to you also for being up so early. I know 
we are all, almost on the same line of longitude, uh, me in, in Africa and you in Europe. Uh, the sun is almost at the same point. So I'm sure, um, sorry, I've got a bit of hay fever. I'm sure that the sun is coming up where you are or should be coming up where you are around about, you know, same time. Um, I know the sun is, I've, I can see the window over my computer. The sun has come up since I've been doing this. Uh, Stephanie says, great group here. And Karina says, that, that suits me. I am in my element. So I know this isn't for everyone. Not everyone is interested in art. Some people find it like very alien. Um, I find it really interesting and it gives a lively alternative to the dreariness often of true crime. This is all an outdoor setting and in another way it's like traveling. Um, and because I was so interested in what I was writing about, I did go and travel to these places and it really was um, something quite special. Axie says it is 11.54 here in Vermont. Axie, you must be fairly close to Stephanie. Stephanie's in Cincinnati. Terry says I'll be able to join the first hour at that time before I have to go to work. I'll take whatever I can get. Okay. Thanks a lot, Terry. Okay, I think I'm going to try and end this before the three-hour mark. Um, but I just want to thank all the new members who've made it. And I want to thank the mods again that, that have been here. Thanks a lot to you guys. And those of you who are not members, consider, considering, consider becoming a member. And if you're really into this, you might want to join Patreon to get uh, some of the... Remember, I script these episodes. may not seem that way. And then I put some of the photos I took when I was in Orvez into those scripts. And that I think does help some of the patrons. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the patrons um, uh, are here, are members here as well. Tooth in jowl. Stephanie says, thank you, new members and my fellow mods, and thank you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to um, take Timmy for a walk. It's nice and early still, and uh, he's, he's kind of having a stretch. Timmy, do you want to go for a walk or do you want to sleep? How's this arm by my neck, almost like saying, leave me? Timmy, do you want to go for a walk? He's still got that slow breathing going on. Okay, so um, thanks very much to you guys for joining me. I'll see you guys next Wednesday, a little bit earlier more than likely. Um, I might also do a live stream on Brian Laundry this weekend, but fingers crossed on that one. There's something I really feel has helped me understand how he thinks and feels, and you're going to be quite surprised uh, where I got that intertextuality from. Um, okay, Karina says, more coffee for me and feeding the cat. Okay. I know my cat wants to be fed right now. Madeline Jimenez, is it Jimenez? Uh, thank you from Southern California. Okay. Thanks, guys. I'll see you guys next time. Take care. Bye.